All right, right. it's 730. 7.30. Are we ready, ready to go, go uh, Celeste and Cindy? Cindy? Um, if we, if we, we just, we're live, we, so in 45 seconds, Celeste, you Yeah, if we, if we can, can just wait, wait since we have a new um, operator we don't usually use. I just want to make sure that everything's smooth. It should. We should oh, we've got a smooth operator, Celeste. We are broadcasting. It's just play, so. You're a smooth operator. I, sometimes. All right. Uh, sorry to, for the delay. <laughs> All, right. All right. We are ready to go if you would like to start, Mr. Mayor. All right. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, January 18th, 2022 work session of the Falls Church City Council. We're pleased you all are able to join join with us. Um, Ms. Hester, did you want to read a notice and call roll? Yes, thank you, Mayor. The meeting for which this agenda has been posted will be held pursuant to and in compliance with the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, Section 2.2-3708.2, and state and local legislation adopted to allow for continued government operations during the COVID-19 declared emergency. All participating council members uh, and other boards will be present at this meeting through electronic means, and members of the public can view the meeting at www.fallschurchva.gov slash council meetings, as well as on FCC TV, Cox 11, RCN 2, and Verizon 35. City Council work sessions are conducted to allow council members to discuss upcoming legislation and policy issues, and the public is not generally invited to speak. Public comment may always be sent to City Clerk at Falls Church VA. All comments are provided in full to the members of council and will be summarized at the next regular meeting. <coughs> Moving on to roll call, uh, Ms. Connolly. Here. Thank you. Mr. Duncan? Here. Here. Ms. Hardy? Here. Ms. Leon? Here. Ms. Sean Siscott? Here. And Mayor Tartar? Here. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Snyder's here as well. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> so, all right. The, gang, the gang's all here. here. Um, and, and welcome, welcome to everyone. everyone. Um, we do have a busy agenda tonight. We did have today's Tuesday. We normally meet on Monday. Yesterday was Martin Luther King birthday celebrations, which were uh, quite well attended and quite uh, quite important and moving. Um, many of us on council were able to attend. Um, so our thanks to uh, the very very folks, Mr. Henderson, and others who helped organize the event. It was quite well done. Um, we do are joined with the folks, our friends from the CACT for discussion on all issues, transportation and transportation safety, which is a great topic of conversation. We're delighted um, the CACT folks can join us this evening. But I thought I'd start by asking our city manager if you had any introductory remarks you'd like to make or anything but before we get started. Well, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Tarter and members of council and uh, uh, Chair Gustafson and members of the CACT, uh, it's good to be with you this evening. What I would propose, uh, we do have a presentation tonight, and um, and what I would propose is that we start with a report from Chief Gavin, and she has uh, information on um, on uh, enforcement measures and things that the city is doing on the enforcement front. She also has statistics on accidents. Uh, vehicle uh, trips in the city trends and um, and other data to share and I would suggest that we stop after her presentation for a discussion of that and any questions and then from there move on to projects and we would start with a review of the neighborhood traffic calming program we have Jeff Sykes on the call and we also have Cindy Mester um, I think we'll, we'll allow Cindy to just to give an overview of status of the NTC projects and, um, and then have a discussion on those. From there, Tara Hoff, our Deputy Public Works Director, <clears throat> um, as our sort of our first cut at our proposed sidewalk improvements or, or missing links of new sidewalks that we'd install throughout the city, and then a review of major 
transportation projects that are either um, about to start construction or are in the design process right now. And then we would wrap up our, and, and then have a discussion on those items. And then our last item in this uh, discussion would be uh, Scott Freda as our project manager for the uh, Annandale and South Maple roundabout intersection. He's joined, joined by our uh, design consultant um, and um, and he will discuss that uh, that design and we'd like to have a council discussion about that to be the first roundabout in the city and the rationale for that project is to improve pedestrian safety uh, as well as the overall efficiency of the intersection um, so that's the plan for tonight we do intend the staff presentations to be brisk and concise so that there's plenty of opportunity for council questions and CACT questions and discussion for each of these items. We look forward to a good discussion tonight. We've got a lot to share, uh, but we wanna touch base with the governing body and have a discussion about priorities and about uh, things we can do to promote safety in the city. Uh, so with that introduction, <clears throat> unless there are any questions for me, I'll turn it over to Chief Gavin and again, she'll go through uh, information on enforcement and some key statistics. All right, welcome to Chief Gavin and to all on this call this <clears> evening. <throat> I would just echo uh, Mr. Shields' uh, thoughts of trying to keep things moving. There is an awful lot just on this first item, so a um, lot to get through, but thank you for joining us, uh, Police Chief Gavin. Thank you, Council and the CACT. Um, I have um, going to talk about the uh, police enforcement, but um, full four bullet points I wanted to hit on was police initiatives as it relates to enforcement, the challenges of enforcement today, the overall data that we have, just a snapshot of the city, and then the enforcement tools that we have here in the city. Uh, first slide, I want to just talk about the current police initiatives. Um, assigned enforcement, the way that we get enforcement um, directed towards us at the police department is we either identify it through uh, needs of or, um, the data that we're given or the complaints received from the community. And what we do with those is we assign those to shifts. Um, and with each shift, they're assigned um, every day um, what we call our, uh, uh, our enforcement assignments. And officers go out and they're assigned to a certain area. Um, they're also, um, supposed to get back to the complainant within a week or so of the initial concern. Um, those, that data is collected in terms of how long they're on the assignment, how many tickets they write on the assignment, and the interaction they have with the community member. And there's a system within our operations division that tracks all of that. Um, as you may have seen or know that we have also deployed a couple physical assets in the community um, within the past year or two. And uh, you've probably seen the community cruiser, which is, uh, we call it P11, which has been deployed throughout the community on hot spots where the community members have talked about difficult traffic um, uh, situations. Um, we probably deploy that every third day. It's moved around a lot. It's not only for traffic, but it also adds as a uh, crime um, prevention um, aspect. It's high visibility, and we've got a lot of good feedback from that P11 vehicle being uh, moved throughout the community. We're working with Department of Public Works on message boards, and uh, this is something we have done in the past, but we're going to kick into uh, full gear. Um, the uh, DPW has two message boards, as you know, coming in to the city. Um, we're going to start putting more uh, traffic safety in uh, initiatives and messages on those boards. We have two safety uh, speed trailers that one is with the sheriff's office and one with the police department, much like the solar powered uh, speed signs that you have on Broad or you have on Lincoln. Um, those do work and they're very effective. These are towed and able to put in specific locations for community or residential. And they do forewarn drivers um, of their speed and actually flashlights at them um, to slow them down. The other thing we have done of late is we, we have reallocated our canine unit to a canine slash traffic unit. 
you probably have seen an increase of enforcement on both the east end and the west end of Broad Street, which is one, of course, the main thoroughfare through the city, and is probably the highest traveled roadway through the city with the most accidents. Um, we've had a lot of good feedback on that. Uh, even this week, I think someone was baking cookies for that person to grab them as they were doing enforcement. Um, but uh, we've had a number of um, good responses from the community. We've kept it on, for the most part, Broad Street um, specifically. But we've allocated that person Monday through Friday, mostly during day work hours and to the rush hours. Um, we anticipate in spring working with OCOM on a public awareness uh, campaign to do a number of things. May it be uh, utilizing seat belts, um, you know, uh, avoiding the distractive driving, putting your phone down, those type of things, and then working with school systems to get with the kids. Um, next slide, if you would. The challenges that you may have already, um, you know and you see, um, for traffic enforcement as of late, last the last General Assembly, there were a number of legislative changes that restricted our ability to make certain traffic stops. Um, most of them were to do with uh, defective equipment, objects hanging, dangling from the rear of your mirrors, tinted windows, um, loud exhaust. That's probably the one that gets most communities the loud exhaust. Um, you know, those were an effort to uh, align with the reform efforts of officers um, making, you know, improper traffic stops. Um, so there is a decrease probably in traffic stops. In, in some part because of legislative changes, um, but a lot of it goes back to the COVID impacts. We have a staffing issues, we have less traveled roadways. Um, an officer, um, you know, uh, now once they make a traffic stop, they have to, to port all of the data that they get in a traffic stop to, um, to a database that we collect for the Virginia Community Data Act. And as you all know, um, during the General Assembly, that act was um, developed based on ensuring that all traffic stops were fair and partial, and the treatment of all people um, was uh, monitored by the public. Um, so the other things that have affected our staffing levels is you know, we often talk about these photo enforcement um, programs, and they are excellent. I mean, um, we were probably the first in the state to um, get a comprehensive contract for red light and stop arm, and many people wrote on our contract because of uh, the way that it was designed. Um, but those programs do take an officer off the street um, because they are heavy. We have a lot of cars that go through those intersections, and with each car that is considered a violation, it has to be viewed independently, uh, individually by an officer. So that does take um, an officer off the street. Um, other legislative barriers that we um, haven't gotten into great detail with, but we look forward to grinding out this legislative uh, General Assembly is the speed cameras. The speed cameras have significant limitations in Virginia. Um, you can only have a speed camera in a um, construction zone on a highway, and you can only have a speed camera in a school zone during a very short period of time um, uh, during drop-off and then pickup. So the limitations on that in the footprint of the city is something that we're looking at, um, you know, because we're beholden to the Constitution of Virginia and it prevents us from doing certain things, the speed cameras, where we're, we're excited about the opportunity, we still have a lot of limitations in that, um, that venue. So we're looking forward to uh, possibly some legislative changes to come. And also we're working with uh, one of the vendors to kind of do an audit of the city to see what would be possibly the best location for those. Uh, but we can get into that later. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I'm going to get into the data right now. And so we do... I'm sorry, uh, Chief, to interrupt you. We do have a hand up, and I don't know if it was relevant to something okay. you were just saying, but um, I'm trying to find out who that person was. Um, let me just see if I can 
Hi, this is Jess Hagenbart. I'm a member of the CACT. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. I, I just had a question about um, what Chief Gavin was talking about with the speed cameras in school zones. And I was wondering if they had a, if you, if you understood what the definition of the school zone is, because I've heard different definitions. One definition I've heard is like, 100 meters within the school but then uh other definitions i've seen are are, are like a broader area around the school do you uh, are you aware of what that definition is in this case we were we were talking about that this week with dpw there is um some specific um parameters around that and the engineers are looking at that because what we think is a school zone may be it may be different here in the city because because like Meridian High School has been set back from um, Haycock so far, that may not be a school zone anymore. Um, so specifically, obviously, Oak Street would be uh, a good one. Um, the preschool, um, Dusty Thackeray might be a good one. Uh, St. James uh, may be one. But there is specific space where something we have to drill down on, but I don't have the specifics for you tonight. Um, but we were talking about, you know, we having these uh, this vendor come out and do that specific audit based on the definitions um, and the changes that we've had in our footprint. So, Thank uh, you. Not much That wasn't much help. But <laughs> no, I, I, well, if you're looking at it, though. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I tell you, Chief, when you get that information, maybe in consultation with the city attorney, if you wouldn't mind maybe pushing it out to all the folks on this uh, meeting call, I think we'd all appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So looking at the data um, snapshot here, um, what I thought we would look at is the traffic stops that we have as a police department and the sheriff's office have conducted through the years. And we did this for fiscal year um, and the citations written um, based on those. So you can see that, you know, we make quite a few traffic stops in this fiscal year. You can see where the drop is and um, as you look at FY 2021, that is a full year of COVID. Um, there are a number of things um, in terms of, uh, you know, that got us to this place. One is the fact that there's a lot less traffic on the roadway. And secondly, that there was a lot less interaction with people. So as you can see the numbers, as you, as you tick up to 22, uh, FY22, obviously we're six months, but we have forecasted that we will probably be, um, and as you can see with the enforcement that I just talked about, we should be tending up here soon and with more at one traffic on the roadway and our emphasis on, um, on enforcement. Um, so we could go to the next one. The vehicle traffic count. Now we used the red light cameras on Broad and Cherry and then Broad and Annadale for our traffic count. Now there's some flaw in that, but obviously, you know, it's a it's an asset that we use for a lot of things. We use it for not only the violations, we use it for video um, and we also use it for um, vehicle count. Now. Similar to what you saw on the previous slide, you see this increase is like six million cars going through uh, Broad and Cherry in FY18 versus going down to almost, you know, um, in during the heart of COVID at FY2021, 1.7 million going through. Um, the forecast is obviously. Um, that we are be ticking up here in 22. Um, what should be noted in 2021 is, is why we're so low is one COVID, but there also was a lot of construction on that broad and cherry light <clears throat> during that time period. Um, so we anticipate <coughs> that the, uh, the program is still very viable. Um, <clears throat> this past six months, we've had some accidents at Cherry and, um, and Broad, and obviously uh, Broad Street is our highest number of accidents in the city, Broad and Washington. Um, but we anticipate um, an uptick 
in not only the uh, the vehicle numbers, but the violations going through. So it gives you an idea of the flow of traffic, and it's and it's similar to what the national you know average is, is what's going on in um, you know in terms of traffic counts. Um, can we go to the next one? So the traffic-related accidents uh, related to injuries versus traffic volume. This one's very disturbing, and I think you probably got a memo from me early in the week describing to the officers and yourselves about the reduction of miles traveled by the United States um, motoring, motoring community. And it's like 13% down in terms of the decrease of miles traveled. But yet at the same time, our fatalities are up a significant amount. Um, and it's really in regards to the unintended consequences of COVID, where globally, nationally, and even regionally, there's this culture of aggression and just irresponsibility as it relates to the roadway, road rage, and one another. There's just, just a significant uptick of reckless driving and serious accidents. We've seen it here in the city. Um, uh, we've had a couple of very serious DUI accidents on midnights. We're very fortunate that no one was killed, but people um, having accidents at like 70 miles an hour uh, careening into parked cars in traffic, and uh, we've, we've experienced that here in the city on Broad Street. Um, so, you know, we just, we see it, we see it in not only the road, but just, just the carelessness, there's less empathy and compassion for others. And, um, overall, I think 2020 was probably one of the deadliest years in the United States for, um, traffic. Um, we do see an uptick, obviously, <coughs> in volume in this next year. And we've already seen that uptick, um, with people moving throughout the city, um, in, in, um, in rush hours. So the next slide. This one is in regards to, and I know it's of great interest, reported accidents. Now these are reported accidents. We go to a lot of accidents that are non-reported, but these are reported accidents compared with accidents with injury. And then I broke it down into having both pedestrian and bicyclist. So the overall accidents, in general, you could say in the city, we had for years past about 500 accidents a year. And you see 486, 493, but these are reportable. There's an additional number of accidents that we have that are non-reportable. But in, in general, the city has about 500 accidents a year. Um, on average, we have about, about 45 accidents with injury out of those 500. Um, in that, break it down even further, is of those 50 accidents in general, 45, 50 accidents with injury, about 11 of them are pedestrians or bicycles. Most of our bicycle accidents are at the crossroad of a bike trail, and our seven crossings. Now, there are some that have been at intersections. We had one that was fairly significant at Cherry and Broad just a couple months ago. Um, but most of our accidents with cyclists are trying to, uh, the crossroads between cyclists and bicycles at the w and and d trail. Okay. The next one. Photo enforcement tools. So as you know, we have the red light cameras. They're invaluable. Um, they, uh, they help us with enforcement. They help us with assessing vehicle volume. And they are incredibly helpful when we have an accident um, where somebody is struck and we can view video because it really just shows you patterns and behaviors of drivers. Um, for instance, the one, at, uh, the one that comes to mind for me is the one at Broad in Annandale when the mother was walking across the street with her baby, uh, it was actually a babysitter, was walking across the street with the two children in a baby carriage. 
and the guy took a right turn on red without even looking, and, and uh, we were very fortunate. They're very minor injuries, but the whole the whole um, pattern or practices plays out with these cameras. Um, we've been very fortunate and be able to to work with the vendor, get search warrants to get you know valuable um, tapes on those types of accidents. Um, the stop arm on the bus buses. We recently um, re-signed an MOU uh, with the schools for a five-year um, extended contract. We're very proud of that program. Um, the um, that again is another program where um, we've learned a lot, and I think we've taught a lot of jurisdictions on um, how to set up that program. Um, again, it's one of those things where you know it makes the the students uh, much safer, makes the bus drivers uh, much more aware of their surroundings, um, and again, it's a video that we get. Um, this was uh, a citizen-initiated program. I don't know if you recall, but there was a child that was running behind a bus, and a, and a car came out and almost hit the child. And uh, from that, um, I think it was Stephanie Oppenheimer was the one that started pushing for this. And um, um, we got it together, and uh, we're probably, again, another one of the first in the state to have this program um, and working with the schools. The speed enforcement. Today... Um, we are working with the vendor to s determine the feasibility of our footprint. Um, much like um, the CACT member had asked, we're trying to define our school zones. Uh, being that our school footprints have moved back from ha um, Haycock, we're determining which is uh, which is the zone and which is which ones are not. Um, as Cindy has indicated before with us, is that there are legislative challenges, uh, making sure that maybe we can open up some of the opportunities for uh, keeping the speed cameras, much like DC um, has, where you know they can do it all it, all hours of the day in many different places. Um, and then you know we need to also uh, think about how we deploy the equipment, and use our human resources in terms of cost. These, these programs are not turnkey in the sense that they, they do expend a lot of human resources. I mean, for every 1,000 violations that are sent to us, we will look over each one of them. There's probably about three to 400 violations that are actually uh, go through the system. And of that, there's probably 25 to 30 of them that actually go to court. So that's an officer um, that's one looking at each one in a time period of, I think it's like seven to 10 days. And then you know, they have to keep on this uh, very rigid schedule. So, you know, it's, it's a great hybrid of, of resources, both human resources, the technical resources. I think that the community, um, in, including the, um, the residents, have been a big part of, of initiating this. Um, we look forward to the feedback from you, you all in the CACT as to how we can, you know, do things better and or uh, deploy more resources out on the street to make it safer. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Chief. Let's um, defer to our friends on the CACT. Uh, Dave and company, do you all, first off, thank you all for joining us and the great work you guys do. This is becoming one of the, um, you know, most active and most important bodies here in the city with so much emphasis on pedestrian safety, uh, what routes to school safety and the like. So we appreciate all the fine work you all do. But I'll just turn it over to you all and, and your your board. Um, do you all have questions or comments on what we've heard so far? Sure. Uh, thank you for inviting us, Mayor Tarter. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Chief Gavin, uh, for that great presentation. We uh, we we know your, uh, your your department is is having to do more with less and under uh, under greater stress uh, from kind of the, the situation out on on the roads. And uh, we've we're very interested in doing whatever we can to work with uh, the city staff, city council, and the police department to help. Uh, improved safety for uh, pedestrians and cyclists, uh, especially since they're uh, the least protected of our uh, of our our users uh, out in the community. 
uh, and also traffic safety as well. Um, I see Art Agan, uh, one of our members has his hand up. So go ahead, Art. Thanks, Dave. Um, I had a couple questions around the cameras, of course. Uh, the first one, you mentioned the red light cameras. I didn't know that they were also used for uh, these other purposes of tracking and uh, video. Have we looked at where are we on expanding that so that even if we're not, if they're not hires where we think there are red light runnings, um, that we can take advantage of them for this tracking and uh, video. The, the three places that came to mind immediately was Broad and Haycock. And I'm wondering if Fairfax already has something. Uh, Broad and West with all the construction and everything going on with Founders Row, we're expecting to have some increase. And the other one that we are very interested in because two of us live near it, but uh, we don't think gets enough attention and that is Broad and Lincoln or Great Falls and Lincoln, I'm sorry. And I'm wondering how far can these cameras see? So would a Great Falls and Lincoln camera be able to provide video for the WNOD crossing uh, that's on Great Falls? Okay, good question. The, the video for us is used to investigate one, the violation itself, and or if we have something where there is a violation or a type of accident in and around the area, we as a police department in our investigation have to do a search warrant to get the information from that camera um, for that time period. So it's not like we can do any casual surveillance with those because we can't. Um, it's, it's specific to the violation, uh, but we do use that. Um, we have had accidents that are beyond the intersection, and what we're trying to do is trying to find, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, the pattern for for which the person was was driving, which where they were driving. But it's the the video capacity is only for the incident itself and or search warrant um, that we would use to kind of capture that. Um, as far as yes, the expansion of the program, we have talked about that. Um, we work with the Department of Public Works. Um, there, there is an engineering piece to this where we have to have a VDOT study, and I'm not, I'm not completely up on the VDOT study as to. Um, I know there was a, there was something in the legislation to waive that, um, but there have been some, some thoughts of Annandale and Maple. Um, that was a high accident area. There was um, Washington. And Annandale, um, Broad and Haycock would be somewhat difficult because a lot of that is Fairfax County. Uh, Broad and West would certainly be a great location. And I understand, you know, Great Falls and Lincoln as well. Um, but I will get with Zach um, Bradley and talk with the, the traffic engineers about um, the possibility of expansion. Um, all what, right. we, what we do know is the most accidents we have are on Broad and or Washington. Yeah, so, so I actually have two quick questions, more questions. One is you mentioned that an officer is required to review the speed and the red light camera um, offenses. So my first question is, do you need an officer to review them to reject them? It sounds like 70% of the reviews do not result in um, violations. So could a non-officer review them and identify those that need to go to an officer for a violation so that their time is more effectively used? And the second related to video again is have we had any discussions around um, participating in doorbell uh, camera programs? I know those can be controversial. Uh, yes, okay. Um, as as it goes to the legislation, it has to be a sworn active officer that views each and every violation. It cannot be like, I can't put my parking enforcement people on it um, or some intern that looks at them, but it has to be a sworn um, police officer, um, basically because they have to swear in court that they, they attest to a violation. Um, as far as doorbell camera programs, um, 
we haven't we haven't done that in terms of uh, tra well we, I can't say we haven't done as far as traffic we have we have requested doorbell ring type um, information more for criminal events but if we have a traffic incident and we're looking for casual surveillance we have asked the community and actually done a door-to-door -door knocks to see if people had um, cameras in on an intersection. Do we have a, a systematic way of doing that? We have not um, engaged in that. We, um, but there are there are programs out there that do that. There they have um, software programs and lots of modules out there, and people selling lots of things to to help coordinate that. But that is an option. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Dave, looks like you've got one. Sure. Um, Chief Gavin, it, it was uh, concerning to hear uh, what you said about a lot of the, uh, uh, to be careful not to say accidents, the, uh, the wrecks involving uh, injuries um, uh, being clustered around the WNOD trail. I know that um, some of the intersection work around the trail it sounded like was being pushed back a few years. We know uh, planning and DCW uh, have have quite the, um, the the backlog of projects uh, going on. So I, I was just curious if um, if the police departments had a chance to to review the uh, the intersection plans uh, for the WNOD trails. And I guess I would uh, throw it out to anyone on on, on staff or council or the police department to see if there's anything that we can do with respect to uh, slowing down the uh, the traffic at the at the WNOD crossings uh, in the short term. Yeah, the WNOD trail in the city, as you know, comes to a head with each intersection. Whereas in other jurisdictions, either goes under, or over, or there's a different type of culture of stop. Um, in the city, um, there are you know obviously some challenges. Um, I think the it. We haven't been able, had enough time with the dual trail um, issue to, or not issue, but benefit to see how that affects our accidents. We do track all the accidents in and around the WO and D um, as it relates to cars and our cars and bicycles or our cars and pedestrians. Um, I, um, we, we work pretty close to with DPW um, when we do have these accidents we send the accident up to the traffic engineers to ensure that they're looking at it as a design perspective we're looking at it as an enforcement perspective um, in the spring typically we get out there and try and reinforce the stop signs that are on the WNOND for the cyclists to stop um, that works for a short period of time um, as you may or may not know, there's a lot of the cyclists that are commuting, um, and they um, they roll through those stops oftentimes. Um, but uh, it's uh, it's it's um, it's seven different crossings. Uh, I dare say about three of them are um, are, are difficult. Um, I think the benefits are going to be the dual the dual trail and the mate the bridge that we have. Overly Highway, um, but uh, we will continue to look at that. We will continue to work with DPW and the engineers um, to kind of study it, and we do welcome your input as to what you think would work. I know that I tried to put signs up on the WOND years ago, and that was um, they didn't think that was too favorable, so they took those down. But we were trying to kind of get people to slow down. Um, and putting people, our officers, on bicycles and our motors to go out and patrol the trails is the uh, best we've had so far. All right, thank you. Other comments or questions for the chief? Ms. Hardy? I was going to defer to anyone else in the CACT. Are you all done? Okay, uh, um, thank yep. you. Thank you, Chief. Um, going back in the WNOD, so one thing I think that might actually be helping some of the behavior changes is that new intersection near Founders Row, because we're asking 
bicyclists to stop and you know use the the ped head essentially that might be at least trying to change the behavior that these crossings you know do require people to stop and hopefully bicyclists don't zoom by um maybe that'll help with the other intersections as well um i did want to start kind of at the beginning so um, i wanted to really thank the chief for kind of that strong leadership message you sent out i think city council had a chance to see that message i really appreciate that that tone, setting the tone i think starts from the top about how we're going to step up enforcement and pedestrian safety is important to the community. So I appreciate that. Um, also all the efforts around enforcement and creatively using parked cruisers. I think you mentioned that there's one parked cruiser that we're using. Is there a reason why we can't do more? Cause I've heard the same feedback that people love seeing them. It actually helps people slow down. Um, is there a reason why we can't park more cruisers around town? Um, there are probably times when we could. Um, there are other times that the rotation of the cruisers wouldn't allow for us to, you know, to do that. But um, we, we can explore that and actually have the sheriff's office to see if they can do the same. But um, we'll see if we can add a cruiser. Um, yeah, if they're not in use, I think it's a great way because I have seen it pretty effective around town. Okay. Um, to echo what I heard from the CACT, I fully support kind of expanding our current red light cameras as well as the speed camera program. I think where we can automate, um, obviously we can't have officers everywhere around town. I think while there are some challenges in you know, defining the school zones and resources to get it started, um, I think it is an important tool in our toolbox. Um, I did wanna then pause on the data. So the accident trend data is clearly going the wrong way. Um, I think nobody likes to see that we're having more accidents and then more interactions with pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, and obviously, I don't think correlation equals causation. And some of it, I think, has to do with the COVID trends with more people speeding and being more reckless. But I am concerned that it is correlated with the drop in enforcement. And I know some of it's due to the fact that there's some leg legislative changes. But what can we do to reverse this trend beyond the kind of actions that we've talked about to date? Well, I, I will say that, you know, um, obviously you have my message that, you know, we need to step up enforcement and it's everybody's responsibility to do that. Um, we have um, taken that canine position, like I said, and made it a canine slash traffic position. We used to have just a solo traffic position. We used to be able to get officers out on the motorcycles as well, but because of staffing, we've been able, would not been able to dedicate them completely. The dedicated traffic is, is really important in all communities. And most communities do have some type of traffic division or section where they, they hone in on traffic safety in the community. They do that for, you know, uh, obviously for, you know, to, to slow the, the speeding, take all the accidents, they become the experts in the field they also are ones that we can supplement for special events and things. Um, so actually having more officers and getting them dedicated to traffic um, would be something that I will probably be putting in for in the budget season. Um, we will be deploying, like I said, the vehicles and as we can, we'll, we'll put more out there. Uh, we work shoulder to shoulder with the sheriff's office um, they're more than willing to go out there and write traffic. The, the problem with us is we're, you know, we're kind of, we're, with the radio traffic, we can only do so much um, with the time allowed between calls for service. There's sometimes they can't do any traffic um, because they're going from call to call to call. <clears throat> and in those times, you know, those are the times when, you know, people, um, you know, likely could get in accidents and things like that. I will say where, as you can see with the data, where enforcement went down, DUIs, and, DUIs did not. Um, so public safety threats um, were still the key component and priority, and a lot of those are on midnights. Um, and that's my, you know, hats off to a couple of the officers on midnights that keep that as their priority. Um, and are recognized each year by uh, Washington Regional Alcohol Program uh, for their efforts. But I would say designated officers. If you, if we need in a community like this, uh, because we are the center hub of uh, the nation's capital, we need dedicated officers to traffic. And I can't, I can't do that with my staffing on calls for service. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, I think clearly we can't ticket our way out of this, but you certainly have my support to increase staffing to kind of focus on this priority because I do think it is probably the top priority that we hear from the community. So thank you. We'll keep that in mind for the budget. All right, Mr. Snyder. Sure. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Thanks to the members of the CACT. Um, Chief, um, a couple questions. Um, the issue of legislation has come up um, a number of times in your presentation, and I know we have a council legislative committee, and we would be very interested in your recommendations for changes to current legislation or new legislation going forward to help with uh, traffic and, and highway safety issues. So that's a request. And, you know, um, as soon as you can get us uh, your recommendations, um, I know the legislative committee would be very interested in finding allies and, and working on those. The second uh, issue I wanted to raise was the, the Council of Government Transportation Planning Board um, did a thorough study of traffic safety about a year and a half ago and provided both reports and recommendations. And I would ask city staff if you haven't had a chance to go through those, to go through them literally one by one to determine what might help us um, in designs of highways, but also in terms of, uh, of enforcement. The third question I have is public communications. Um, you mentioned the sign boards, but um, are there other jurisdictions, Chief, that have done a good job of communicating not only to their own citizens, but drivers passing through that you're expected to comply with our laws? And if you don't, you're going to get caught. I mean, I don't I don't know what the current communication theories are these days, but um, I think there's a major role for um, communicating um, it seems obvious in some cases, and yet it, it's not based upon behavior. Um, what, what are uh, the best sort of uh, driving behaviors for everyone sharing the road? Um, and, and, and finally, the, the, the bike path and, and highway and road intersections, it seems to me the most obvious thing would be for us to just, since we're not able to stop the bicyclists, we should make those four-way stops and at least improve the likelihood of, of something like that not happening. And in fact, when I approach the bike path, I stop every time and hope the driver behind me doesn't rear-end me because there is no official stop sign there. But I know based upon the sidelines to be really sure that there's nobody in that bike path, you really need to stop. So I guess my question is, is there anything in legislation that prevents us from making every one of those bike path and road intersections, four-way stops? Um, i go back to number one. The legislative um, committee, I, I do believe there are safety components that were um, thwarted in the last uh, General Assembly about inspection and safety type items, the loud muffler, uh, making those back a primary offense. Um, the uh, tinted windows, not as much, and some of the others, but some of the safety components of vehicles, I think, is important. Um, as far as COG, I, I will need to have to reflect on that report to kind of get back to you on that. Um, as far as public communications, I think we can do a much better job in terms of coordinating um, our enthusiastic young officers that are out there um, doing um, traffic enforcement. I think they can make it fun. I think they can make it interesting. Uh, but I also believe that using the message boards, but nothing speaks louder than those blue lights as you enter the city. And if every morning as I come in around 8.30 to 9 o'clock and I see those blue lights on broad, it's, it's very interesting to see the pattern of traffic slow down immensely. Um, so that, that is probably the best message out there is the high visibility of enforcement on the roadway. The, the other thing that I think the other communities uh, around us, um, some of them have it, some of them don't, but some have called us to get the residential enforcement enhanced penalty that is under the speed limit signs. That is, um, that is a great asset. Um, as far as the bike path intersections, again, I get back with DPW and traffic engineering on can we make those a four-way stop. 
Um, I would say, you know, um, yeah, not only making possibly a four-way stop, but even in some of these intersections, like with the red light, uh, where there's high pedestrian traffic, is to make it a no right turn on red. Um, because people are doing these California rolling stops, and um, they, they don't even care to know if there's a right turn on red. They're just, it's, it's just inherently that's what they're doing, and they're not looking. Um, so I have some homework to do for you, Mr. Schneider, and I'll get back to you on some of that. Okay, thanks a lot. And just just um, know that, um, Alan, you've also heard Council Member Letty say this, and I'm sure it's it's a widespread view. Let us know what the resources are that you need, and we'll do our very best to provide them. Thank you. All right, other comments or questions for the chief? We do have a number of other subcomponents here to get to uh, under the transportation rubric. Um, if they're not, I'll just, just offer one myself, which is um, I would encourage you to try to get the visibility, and it sounds like in your remarks that, that you are heading this way, but more visibility on some of the neighborhood streets and some of the cut through streets. I think people have a pretty good idea about Broad Street through their experiences, but I think there are plenty of smaller streets um, that could use even an occasional presence. I know the car is great, but just uh, an occasional presence, I think, will have a chilling effect on speeding way beyond just that one day uh, a month where people might happen to be on a side road. Um, so I think those kind of creative solutions and, and ways are a good way to, to deal with this. But lots of good stuff here. Let's move on to our next um, area, the sidewalk program. Wyatt, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Cindy Mester will walk us through the neighborhood traffic calming uh, program. And uh, I'll just note Jeff Sykes is also on the call. But Cindy, let me turn it over to you for a briefing on current status. We had some stormwater um, ponding issues to work through. The feedback from the community took a while to get there. COVID delayed us with the community engagement, but the feedback we're getting with the revised um, plan with a lot of community input is very positive. Um, and I have a couple slides that we'll talk about Greenway Down and South Oak South Lee pretty quickly. Um, Grove Avenue and Lawton Avenue are NTC programs, but were tied to the redevelopment. Um, and that was a good partnership to mitigate impacts on those communities. And Founders Row listed on the right is a pending voluntary concession that would help in that area with NTC-like projects. Uh, I will note that we've had some interest and in inquiries from community members in different streets, but right now we do not have any new active petitions coming forward for the NTC program. This is the Greenways Down uh, neighborhood project. This is the one we've talked about with the federal grant that's a little over 600,000. The red line highlights the whole um, scope of the area. But as we've talked about, we are actually focusing on each of the roads within that community to make sure it's tailored to that street, doesn't have crossover and unintended consequences. And with um, Mr. Sykes being the lead, um, we've stood up the working groups, which will have representatives from each street, and then sort of a, an umbrella big group. So we will <coughs> shortly have conceptual plans, and then we'll be um, meeting with the community. Um, unfortunately, those conceptual plans have been built on a strong uh, community input from a survey that helped us get it started, and then we'll be coming back to the community. So there'll be a lot more on Greenways Down than we'll, than we'll cover tonight. 
The South Oak South Lee is just to highlight that we've gotten through um, the light solutions. We have some um, speed humps and so forth that we're finalizing with the community. And then when we have the warmer weather, they'll be um, in. So you have a mix of um, speed humps and improved signage, which is important leading up to the school area. Um, this also will have, after South Oak South Lee, we'll do the um, bridge work um, that's before the school and then you connect to Greenways Down. So it's really looking holistically at the community. There is some missing sidewalk links interests on South Lee and that'll be looked at under the sidewalk program as well as we've had some of that come up in Nolan, Midvale and other NTC projects. So we're glad to be able to work on sidewalks. And with that, I can pass the baton over to Tara. Hello, thanks, thanks Cindy. Cindy. Um, thanks, um, so I'm Tara Hoff, engineering manager. manager with the city, and I'm covering for Zach tonight because unfortunately he could not be here with us. And I'm going to walk you through some of our DPW projects and programs that focus on transportation safety. Um, the first one is our Missing Links program, which is really our sidewalk program for the city. And this, um, the project selected for this program aimed to connect smaller missing links of sidewalk and improve pedestrian networks and increased safety. Our current list of projects is shown on this slide. We've got South Maple from Wallace to Tenor Hill, Tenor Hill from South Washington to the historic site, Annandale from Hillwood to Fairfax County, and then Northwest Street from Lincoln to Steeples. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the next slides will show you a visual of each of the projects that I just mentioned, just so you can better picture what we're talking about when we're talking about addressing these missing links. This is the one on South Maple Street from Tenor Hill to Wallace Street. Next slide. And this is Tenor Hill Road from Washington to the historic site. Next slide. Then we've got Annandale and Hillwood, which runs from Hillwood to the county line. Um, the three projects that I just showed you are projects that we have already looked at for feasibility and budget, and we plan to roll those out. Uh, this spring or summer. Um, they are currently like in our queue. And next slide. We also have this project that just came up recently on Northwest Street from Lincoln to Steeples. This is actually part of a new subdivision application and we're going to require that the applicant um, address the missing link of sidewalk as part of our approval for that subdivision. Um, so we hope to address that missing link through the developer who is applying for that subdivision there. Uh, next slide. We also have a couple of other ones that are worth mentioning. We've got Cameron and Sharrow Streets with a sidewalk and crosswalk. Um, that's just a small section. A lot of it will be addressed through a private developer and we'll just be addressing a small section of that with city funds to kind of close that gap and, and make sure that the um, network is fully connected. And then 412 West Broad Street in front of Beto's. Um, we actually have this project covered in our West Broad Multimodal Project scope, and it's funded separately with federal funds. Um, however, if we wanted to, we could consider taking this project and funding it through the missing links. But in doing so, we would have to completely remove that portion of the project from the federally funded West Broad Multimodal Project. Um, just something to keep in mind when we think about missing links and what we want to do with those funds in the future. Uh, next slide. So some of our biggest challenges with the sidewalk program is overhead utility conflicts. Many areas have a pole on the sidewalk and that ends up severely limiting the width of the sidewalk in those areas, as I'm sure you all know. Um, and we do have in a contract with Dominion, if we have an ADA issue, they should be able to move a pole for us. But unfortunately, they are only able to move multiple poles at a time. And this has created you know, a lot of um, challenges, I suppose, in terms of how we're going to address some of these smaller missing link projects and one of the possible solutions that we've come up with in terms of maybe being able to address some of those areas with missing links is working on obtaining the easements in advance to relocate poles where we know that they're a problem. Um, this will take a considerable amount of time and considerable amount of effort to come up with a list and start that process. 
but it is one potential workaround that could work in our favor for addressing these areas. The second one is to start to consider removing on-street parking in order to, to connect missing links, specifically in areas where um, maybe the grading is not really conducive to putting in a sidewalk, and all of a sudden you have you know, a $500,000 project just to address one smallest missing link, or where we don't have right away, which is also one of our biggest challenges with this program. It's much more feasible for us to address areas where we already have existing right away. Um, because the budget is quite small and they do need to be smaller projects in order for us to achieve that. But we continue to work on addressing these missing links. And as we do so um, each and every time, I think it does make the city safer for pedestrians and um, is one of our transportation safety programs. Next slide. We do have a couple of other sidewalk programs just worth mentioning. Um, we have two programs that address sidewalks. One is our grinding program. And this addresses tripping hazards in the uh, citywide. This program is mostly informed by citizen requests. Um, we gather all the data that we get from citizens over the course of time. And we go out each year and address X amount of tripping hazards by grinding. Right now, we actually have two to three years worth of, um, of programmatic like planning. Operations is currently in the process of figuring out exactly which ones we'll be doing this year but we have enough um, potential areas to cover multiple years at this point of tripping hazards that we've already identified based on our current budget. And uh, the other thing that we have is ADA compliance. This kind of relates directly to our paving program. So each and every time we go out and pave a road, we are required to bring all of the curb ramps up to ADA standards. And that is um, federally mandated and triggered by the repaving of the road. One thing that we've discussed internally many times is um, at some point maybe getting enough funding in that pro program where we can make it more holistic and ultimately replace sidewalks and do sidewalk repairs and kind of um, create like anything adjacent to that paving project since we're already out there doing the work. Why not just go ahead and bring our sidewalks up to snuff at the exact same time? Um, so that's something that would be a really cool program for us to continue to work on improving our sidewalk network and address missing links as part of the paving program. But again, that will require additional funding um, if the program becomes that large. Next slide. So some other pedestrian initiatives we have are our traffic signals. Um, so we're constantly striving to make our signals as safe as possible. We have added eight, we have eight LPIs, leading pedestrian intervals, in the city right now. We original or about three years ago we had four and then we went ahead and relooked at our signals and added an additional four um, based on our current timings. And those were locations where we could add them. And for those of you who don't know, the leading pedestrian interval um, gives the person crossing the street a head start prior to the uh, traffic light turning green for oncoming traffic. Um, I feel like those have been very well received in the city. And as we continue to look at future optimization and timing um, when we will be doing a complete retiming of the signals, we can explore further pedestrian friendly timings and what else can be done in the city. Um, one thing to note about that when we do start to look at the optimization of our traffic signals again is where our prioritization lies with regards to auto traffic versus pedestrian traffic. And we just need to fully consider the pros and cons associated with whatever approach we choose to move forward with. Next slide. So now I'm just going to walk you through some of our larger CIP projects that currently address transportation safety. Um, so we've got the South Washington Multimodal Project, which is going to include the transit plaza, streetscape, additional sidewalk, and tighter intersection geometry. And it's expected to be completed in March of 22. We have the South Washington and Maple intersection and construction will begin soon in 2022. That project will include a new signal and additional crosswalks and some additional accommodations in the sidewalk as well for pedestrian safety. Next slide. We've got our LED streetlight conversion project. Um, this project will continue to address transportation safety by making the lighting better for on our pedestrian walkways. 
ultimately, and the pilot locations have been determined. We have James Street, Fulton Avenue, and Cherry Hill Park. And that'll be rolling out soon. Next slide. Um, so some projects that we have that are near construction, just waiting on one or two things to happen before we can move forward on them is Washington and Columbia. We have one remaining, remaining easement to acquire for that per, um, project, but we do have a construction contract in place. And that project will replace all of the crosswalks and curb ramps um, and the whole signal at Washington and Columbia. And then we have South Oak Street Bridge, and we expect to award that in August. And that will also include a new crosswalk and improved sidewalks. Next slide. Um, we have a couple of projects that are also near construction. These ones are a little bit trickier. So we've got the, the trickier in the sense that we're going to have to determine which one of these ones we move forward with first. So we have the Broad Street Hawk signals, which is the three Hawk beacons at Broad and Oak, Fairfax and Buxton. Um, and then we also have the WNOD dual trails crossings at Little Falls, Great Falls, North Oak and North Spring. Um, because of our current staffing, these two projects cannot proceed through the VDOT IFB process at the same time. And so one will have to be prioritized. And the feedback that I've received most recently is that to move one of these projects through the process takes six to eight months. So we do need to determine when we get to the point where these are ready to move forward, which one do we want to do first? Next slide. Um, Projects that are currently in engineering include West Broad Multimodal, which will have wider sidewalk, sidewalks, a hawk beacon between Virginia and Pennsylvania on Broad. Um, again, this project includes that missing link for the frontage of Beto's, but we have to determine if we want to consider pulling that as part of the missing links or keeping it in this project that already has the federal funds. Um, brick crosswalks at multiple intersections. And right now this is 60% designed and right away acquisition is expected in late 2022. Next slide. We have Park Avenue Great Streets. Um, this project is about at 30% design. It includes brick sidewalks, bump outs, undergrounding of utilities, and improved pedestrian access in general. Next slide. Um, then we've got projects in engineering. We've got Berman Park. That one's also at 30% design. That will include a sidewalk from southwest to the park pavilion and additional crosswalks. And we also have the South Maple and Annandale intersection. This is the one that um, Wyatt spoke to earlier where we're going to be converting it to, considering converting it to a roundabout with improved crosswalks and um, traffic calming. And we actually have uh, Scott Frieda, who is our CIP project manager for this project here with us tonight, along with our design consultant from RDA, who is the engineer of record on the project. And right after this presentation, they will be providing you more information and a brief presentation on that roundabout and what work they're doing there to improve transportation safety. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very a lot much. going on. Uh, we've got a few <laughs> questions question here. here. The first one, uh, Jess, did you have a question or comment? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Great brief, I appreciate that. that was a lot of um, new information that I hadn't heard before. And I actually, I want to apologize. I do have several questions, and and I don't know if if you guys will uh, humor me and let me ask all of them. But my first, uh, more of a comment with the power pole. I'm trying to keep track in order of my questions. The power poles with Dominion. I think I heard you say that <clears throat> they don't want to just uh, only address one at a time. Um, and my response to that is, I'm pretty sure between me and my CACT comrades, we could probably come up with a dozen power pole issues like off the top of our head in five minutes. Um, so if if there if we could help with that, um, we would be happy to. Um, is that something that you would be uh, uh, amenable to to receiving from us if we could give you? It, a hand, you know, a list of power pole and and those guide wire issues with sidewalks. Um, would that be helpful to you? Uh, yeah, I think having an inventory of that information would definitely be helpful. One of the biggest issues that we've ran into in the past is also we need to have a location to put the pole. And so once we move it, where are we going to put it? 
And that's kind of what I was speaking to earlier about finding, um, acquiring some easements in advance as well as to where we're going to put these when we move them. But yeah, no, I would appreciate that for sure. sure. Okay, yeah, I think um, I can. I'll get with uh, my my car runs offline about about how we can help with that. And we don't necessarily we won't necessarily be able to answer the the where to put them uh, question, but we could def we definitely have a lot of a lot of them identified. Um, as far as I heard you kind of alluding to, so I know we had a lot of missing links that we're trying to fill in and we have some additional ones that we included in the memorandum that we provided. Um, I, I, my, I think I speak for, for all of my, um, uh, comrades on the CACT that with, with sidewalks, we, we, would really like to be able to see that everything is kind of coming up to modern day standards. And so I understand, I think I've been told that our 1950 circus sidewalks where we see that are about three feet, I think we've been told that they're ADA acceptable. Um, but, you know, according to modern day standards, you know, we see sidewalks that are a lot more, a lot wider. And so I, my second question is, is that something that you guys, when you guys are doing new, inputting new sidewalks or redoing sidewalks, are you really kind of bringing out to modern day standards when you're doing that? Uh, yes. So new projects, we're always making wider sidewalks. Um, we're continuing to make them as wide as I, I believe that it's at least five feet. Um but with the older sidewalks so that we're kind of retrofitting in, it's kind of a balance between how much that project is going to cost and what we can do with the money that we have to make that connection. We would always prefer to put in a wider sidewalk, but sometimes there's right-of-way constraints and some other things that just don't allow us to do it. So we have to kind of determine, are we going to put in the sidewalk or are we going to wait six or seven years till a project comes along that can actually fund a wider sidewalk? Um, but we definitely are working to move everything in a direction where we have much wider sidewalks for the city. Uh, thank you. And I, again, I understand where I see a lot of hands up. Last, last question for me for now is um, along that same lines with bringing things up to standards. Um, I have this, uh, my fantasy is that all of the residential side uh, intersections look like the intersection at Parker and Kent, where there are bump outs at every corner and there's no stop signs like as you're driving along Parker and I've driven through there at least a hundred times, but every time I drive through there, I, I want to stop because it, it just, it makes you slow down. And, and I love that about that intersection. Um, because I would, I really want to see drivers <laughs> drive more, drive slowly during through our residential streets. Right. Um, anyway, so that's, like I said, that's my, that's my fantasy. And so my same question as, kind of before applied to intersections where when you guys are addressing an intersection, um, are you able to consider putting in bump outs uh, at any intersection that you are doing anything to? Um, I mean, that, that would be my request is that you at least consider that option in order to get intersections more up to today's standards as well. Yeah, we consider bump outs at many intersections. We're actually working right now on an urban tactical project at Maple and um, Annandale that would kind of address some of the issues there. And um, yeah, I, I, it's something that we consider for sure. Uh, it's just, it, it really depends on the particular intersection, if it lends itself to that or not, and, and what um, protection that will provide versus if if it is a street that allows trucks and stuff, are they still able to maneuver and things like that? So we just need to keep all of those things in mind. But yeah, we're, we're for a traffic calming perspective, definitely look at bump outs. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna start with our CACT um, folks. So I'm gonna go on now to Art. Did you have a comment or question? Yeah, it goes back to the the ramps, the ADA ramps when with utility work. Um, I, I'm glad to hear that because that explains what happened on Lincoln Avenue recently. 
uh, with all this water main w work, they came in and they redid all the corners. But it raised the question of, we've been having discussions for a while now about the greening of Lincoln Avenue, and there's been discussions around bringing in that um, uh, traffic calming and the bump outs. And there's a couple places where we know we want one, we know they need to be there. Have we looked at how do we address those opportunities when the when these ramps and corners are being redone already because of utility work to bring them up, bring in the the bump outs and uh, network traffic calming when they're they're already digging up the uh, concrete and replacing it. So Okay, so if I understand your question, you're kind of asking how do we better coordinate the work? Is that correct? So that we're kind of addressing some of these things w when we're already out there doing construction? Is that exactly. We're ar they're already out there doing all this work, and we have an opportunity to implement network traffic calming at the same time with basically or same or minimal cost. Right. Um, <laughs> a lot of it depends on how, so I agree with you. I mean, any time that we can do that and make sure that we're coordinating the work, that is always better for everyone and for the city and for budget. Um, it does depend on where the projects are at. So a lot of that comes back to just having a bunch of projects that have already been conceptualized and are far enough along in the design process that we would be able to start to marry some of these things up. I know the greening of Lincoln and everything that's kind of been more recent through the stormwater task force, some things that we've identified there um, that we want to accomplish. And I don't think we're at a point, and please, if anyone is on the call who can correct me, where we're ready to roll any of that work out. I think we're pretty far from that. Um, where when Lincoln was repaved, we had no choice but to bring those curb ramps up to ADA standards. That is a federal law, and we are required to do so. Um, it's unfortunate that the projects didn't uh, marry up better, but that's something that as we continue to build a list of projects, we can start to work towards making that happen more and more. I hope that answers your question. I think we need to get ahead of this. Um, the Lincoln Avenue utility work was, of course, unexpected. And so when those opportunities come up, I think we need the opportunity to jump in very quickly, make it happen. And I'm assuming the repaving is going to happen in the spring because it's the utility work is still patchy <laughs> from the water. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Ms. Connolly. Thanks, Mayor Charter. Uh, thanks, Tara and Cindy, for that really thorough description of a lot of areas in the city that we, many of us have walked on and noticed. Um, and I'm glad to know there's a plan for them. There's a couple other areas that we've talked about over time that you didn't mention today, and I'm not sure if that means they're not in the queue or they're just, there's so many things to talk about. One is the intersection of Lee and Broad. Um, we've talked about that for years, about the need for more pet heads there. Does that fall into this program or a different program? Um, Lee and Broad would fall more, I, I think, with our with the pedestrian signals. I know exactly what you're talking about, and mm -hmm. we definitely do need more pet heads there. Um, and that would be something that falls into our traffic signals program. Okay. We have taken a look at that. Um, you know, I'll have to circle back with the group and see where that is in the queue, but we are aware of Lee and Broad and the improvements that we need to make there. Okay, that's great. And then uh, this summer and fall, when I was working with the Safe Routes to School group, we identified areas that weren't sidewalks, but are crosswalks that need to be added. Zach and I talked about those. Um, some of them are on here, some of them aren't. One is across Virginia Avenue near Shero. Uh, there was another one you mentioned by Cheryl and Cameron where you're adding sidewalk where there's a developer building, but that intersection also needed, there was some restriping that needed to get done. And I just want to make sure that all of those are yeah. somewhere in the queue. 
we definitely have that list. I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Um, the a lot of those will be restriped through our restriping fund, which okay. as long as we don't, it doesn't require any concrete work or any sort of curb ramps or sidewalk, that would come out of a different fund altogether. Okay. Um, and I, I do know that we have that list and we're working on it. The one on um, South Virginia is does require a ramps. It's a whole okay. new crosswalk. So again, I don't know if that fits under the sidewalk program or another program, but definitely one of those that where kids are walking to school and it should be safer. Um, and then you mentioned the handicap access. And I'm just wondering, as we're working on these projects, is there also the, uh, the safe markings for people who are handicapped or using wheelchairs or um, strollers to cross the street and not get stuck in spots where sidewalk ends? Is that that I just want to make sure that's all part of the program because that's what we've heard from people as well. Yes, that would definitely be the goal of the program. Um, the federal requirement is when you repave that you must update the curb ramps. So, right. so that is what we have to do. And we kind of, it does kind of, um, we end up doing fewer projects sometimes just because that is, uh, it, that can be a pretty heavy lift for yeah. a paving project to update each of those curb ramps. Um, but as far as like missing links and things like that, those are always things that we are looking at. I know that there's a number of areas on Hillwood where you just have a ramp that kind of doesn't go anywhere. We are aware of those. And um, it's just constantly something that we're continuing with that missing links. It's so great that we have this missing links program now because it allows us right. to start to really look into this and take a deeper dive. But we're still uncovering exactly what that looks like and mm -hmm. continuously trying to improve. Yes. So it would also be helpful along with this report to have a map to see where all those missing links are. Yeah. And we have, I, over the years, we've had different maps, but that would be really helpful. Right. So again, thank you. I've got other little things, but I know there's many other questions and many more miles to go. So I'll pass it on. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right, Ms. Hiscott. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to be clear the $300,000 of the sidewalk program that we have already assigned budget wise is that what's going to be attributed to these first programs, the South Maple, Tinner Hill, Annandale, Northwest streets? Um, the, the three we have about that takes up, I want to say, oh, I wish um, I think it's 150. And then what we're doing right now is we're working with, we're still kind of working through that specifically. I wouldn't say that necessarily will address all three. It definitely addresses the first two. Um, and then we're working on getting additional quotes and we're hopeful that by February, March timeframe that we will have a complete list that will cover that full 300K. That's a little bit more. These are potential candidates at this point. Um, we know that we're fully funded for the first two, but the rest we do have to take a little bit closer look and continue to get some more quotes. It seems that contractors right now are not very willing to provide quotes because it's the middle of winter. We've been told by all of them that they will be back up and running with quotes by mid-February. So that's when we'll be able to really start to solidify the program and make sure that the list that we're providing matches up with that 300K. So it's still a work in progress, but we're getting closer. Okay, and to the extent that the list extends beyond that 300K, I'm interested in knowing what that is so that when we're looking at budget, we can make sure um, we're taking care of, of uh, what many people have told us their top priority is pedestrian safety and we wanna support the work that you're doing. And to that extent, um, there are several points in time in the um, presentation we talk about um, things that are on hold because we don't have staffing um, or budget to do. Um, and I apologize, I didn't get a chance to read this before the meeting um, because of the timing of it. So I'm sure you remember which project it says we, oh yeah, this is the dual uh, hawk signals and trail crossings is due to staffing resources. These projects can't proceed. Um, I just want to state that, you know, I'm, I'm interested in knowing what kind of staffing levels it would take to get projects moving forward and then what kind of numbers um, what kind of budgets needed to move forward several of the rest of the missing link and and all these other great project uh, projects that you guys have working on obviously there's a lot happening a lot to keep track of but um i'm sure i speak for many of us when i say that we want to support that work that you're doing um when we hear that we already know we are two to three years out in grinding project or how many you know miles out we are on paving um 
you know, I, we want to accelerate that. I, I want to accelerate that. I want to make sure that we're providing the budget and the staffing that um, you need to get those things done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll circle back with that. what that exact effort would take from a staffing resource. This note was actually put in the slides by Zach, so I'm guessing he has a pretty good idea as to what that looks like. Um, Thanks. I'll leave all the specific questions for later meetings, but it's just a general overstate, overall statement. Um, and then on the projects that don't have dates uh, on them, we assume that those are just in um, like research or pre-engineering stage. Like a lot of them you'll say, um, you know, starts in 2022 or in August, or like you just mentioned for missing links. Um, I'm just interested yeah. in knowing. So when people say when, you know, when is the traffic, we've been talking about the traffic calming for X amount of years. When is this happening? Just a general idea so we can get back to people and say it's in progress. It'll happen, you know. Yeah, and I can circle back with our CIP um, program manager and get our projected dates for each of those projects. The yeah, ones that are closer to construction, that's a much more concrete date. The ones that are in design, um, it, they do have a tendency to kind of fluctuate depending on how things go during the design process. But I can get a projected list to you. Yeah, and just a range of times. Obviously, anybody's worked in project management or and has lived through COVID and every, all the other um, things that are happening, but just to get a general idea of where things are in priority queue and when we're anticipated to start work or be in progress or complete that work. Um, that's, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hardy. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for joining us, Tara and Cindy. Um, as I was saying earlier in the enforcement conversation, we can't ticket our way out of pedestrian safety, so all of this infrastructure stuff is really so important, so thank you for all the hard work. Clearly, we have lots of balls in the air, and I think I echo kind of Debbie and Mary Beth's sentiment that we are willing to fund this and more, because um, I do hear that this is one of the top priorities. So I'm going to start from the beginning of the presentation when Cindy talked about NTC. Um, Cindy, my understanding from what I heard you say is we did a good job clearing the queue. We don't have any new active projects kind of entering the queue. Do you have the budget and the resources you need um, to keep that up? For the active projects, I think we're good money, and each year we're trying to keep that 100000 in the CIP to make sure we can handle the small queues, uh, the smaller projects that come in. I think what we're seeing now, a lot of the inquiries are around sidewalks. So like Tara said, we're appreciative of Council's focus and funding on that because oftentimes where it's, quote, safe because of neighborhood traffic calming focus and policy, what's missing is the sidewalk so kids are in the street walking to the school bus. So I think right now we're good for NTC. I think as we develop this next CIP, which we've just started with staff and we'll be going to the Planning Commission in February, we will need to be looking closely at sidewalks, for example, and making sure that's funded. Um, a lot of the staffing that you all were just talking about that was on the note of which prioritizing, that is uh, projects that were getting backed up in the procurement contracting stage. So we're, we've got engineers, we've got PMs, and what we can't get it through that coordination piece, which was a conversation we talked about with ARPA. So Zach does have some um, identification of staffing needs, so we'll certainly have to bring that forward. So I think as we do the CIP, um, we'll be able to be more granular on what we need for sidewalks and what grant opportunities we have and where we need um, to look at local funding. We also do have the recent ARPA money that will funnel into that. Um, so this conversation um, this evening is very helpful because it's timely for the development of the CIP and where council and the community and CAT's prioritization will help us at a staff level, develop it. Yeah, yep. and, and I think, I think why, why getting mentioned, mentioned wanting, wanting to know, know or get, get feedback, feedback on the piece of progress. And I think hearing from the community, many of these projects people wanted done yesterday, right? So I think certainly people are willing to invest here, and um, I think I certainly am. So moving on to sidewalks, um, I think Beatos was kind of called out as one that Tara was looking for input on is whether we wanted to pull it out of that West Broad project. 
Um, so I certainly would support it mainly because I think it's a really glaring example of bad accessibility on one of our main commercial streets. It's been long talked about. I think at our last meeting, we talked about Karen Oliver. So I remember Karen Oliver brought this up six years ago and it's still not done. Um, so I would love to increase the speed of that. Um, Carol, if you need additional legal resources here, I think we are willing to um, help with that as well. So I would like to see it pulled out um, and move on that as quickly as possible. Um, on the missing link sidewalk, um, I love hearing about all those projects. Tara, I heard your concern around um, how to manage those, especially with the pole issue, especially with the costs involved with poles. We have no shortage of missing link sidewalks, right? So do we have sidewalk identified where we don't have pole issues? Because I think part of it is also just generating momentum for the program. And if there are places where we don't have poles, can we tackle those stretches of sidewalks first rather than tackle the ones that are really hard that requires easements and moving poles? Um, has staff looked at you know, potential candidates that wouldn't have that, that much complexity? Absolutely. That's what we primarily focus on with the budget that we have currently. We do look for those shorter links that already we already have right away. We don't have a pole on the sidewalk and we can make a quick connection because really, to be honest, that's what we can afford with the program right now. Um, so that is our number one priority is we kind of assess it. Sorry, there's an echo. <laughs> um, we assess it from... Uh, kind of a demand standpoint. So we can, we put together our candidates and we use input from CACT, from other staff. We kind of look through past recommendations and then we start to look at demand, how many pedestrians are actually using the facilities in this area. And then we start to look at feasibility and that's how we come up with our, our final list. That prioritization is really important. And one of the policy pieces that staff would benefit hearing from council on is um, using the street and the right of way for a sidewalk instead of trying to secure easement from a property owner. One, that costs, but two, if, as Tara said, we own the right of way, the street. We can often do that much easier because you don't have to move poles because you're going out in the street narrows the street, has some traffic calming effect, but inevitably you're going to lose parking. So there's a trade-off of those prioritizations and balance. So input on that would be welcome. And part of the, just to be clear, I wanted to make sure everybody understood the franchise agreement with Dominion um, is one that requires Dominion to move poles for ADA purposes at, the, at our request and at their cost but as Tara said, we have to provide the place where to put it. So we need to provide the easement or the land to do that. Um, and so sometimes moving the sidewalk out in the street is an easier way to do it if there's no easy way. The other piece for why they don't do one pole, I just wanted to make sure we've experienced this a couple times. It's not that they won't move one pole, but from an engineering standpoint, they can't. They've got to make sure that the power lines are running in a safe, secure manner. And so inevitably, that and the transformer equipment requires more than one pole to move. So a lot of it could be solved if we get creatively on how to move around the pole. But, and that can give you a better sidewalk, it could impact parking. So there's a trade-off similar to intersection work is it the pedestrian or the vehicle so yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's a tricky, tricky one, one but i would say in general, general like, like this is probably where the cact can probably help us because it's i imagine there are places where it's a case-by-case -case basis there are places where we apply have plenty of neighborhood parking and losing some spaces uh, and prioritizing pedestrians it's okay and in other places maybe there's a business that's really dependent on there and so it's probably hard to make a, a cross board statement that says, oh we always can you know use the right of way and give up parking so maybe this is a good place that the cact can help us make that um, decision especially if it's unique um, to that particular sidewalk that does lead me to the related note on the sidewalk program um, it sounds like these are mainly staff driven kind of top down assessments based on where we have mixed miss the missing links maps and where we might have high pedestrians um, I guess at some point, is there room in the program to also make, think of it as a bottoms up program like the neighborhood traffic calming where citizens and neighborhoods can request, hey, I really want a sidewalk on my stretch of the street, similar to NTC where they request it and they have to get, you know, at least 50 percent of the neighborhood signing on um, that might remove some of the um, stress on staff because it's something that the neighborhood would support before entering the process. I would love for us to evolve to that model where it's both tops down of city staff driven as well as bottoms up because I think it removes staff from actually having to make the calls of, 
hey, this neighbor, this neighbor doesn't want to, you know, doesn't want a sidewalk or doesn't want to lose their parking. It puts it back on the neighborhood before they start the process. Um, and then moving on to the non kind of concrete infrastructure changes, Tara, that you talked about, like LPIs. Um, I love all those because I think hopefully these are much easier to do and don't require brand new infrastructure. Um, I think you had proposed a question to us around um, essentially there's a trade off in timing, right? Because you either make cars go fast or you make it safe for pedestrians. It probably is very unpopular for me to say, but I am totally OK prioritizing pedestrians. And if it means cars go a little slower on Broad Street, I'm OK with that trade off. Uh, it's probably worth the discussion, but I think we've heard loud and clear that um, from an equity perspective and just making sure that, again, all modes of transportation um, uh, are safe for people that I am totally OK prioritizing pedestrians and making cars go a little slower on Broad Street. Um, on that same vein, um, I think the chief talked about no right on red at one particular intersection where we had an accident last year. Is that worth exploring at multiple intersections as well? Because I run or walk in the city at least six times a week. Um, I've had so many people nearly hit me while I'm in the crosswalk um, because of that. And so I would love to think uh, uh, where we have kind of high vulnerability um, intersections and implement kind of no right on red. And then even a more extreme version, which is um, a fully protected um, walk signal. So I think we've had citizens propose Broad and Washington could be a really great place where you essentially everyone is red. Um, no one's allowed um, to move cars at any time. Um, and then the pedestrians have first priority. Obviously, it would make cars slow down a bit, but I think it's worth piloting and testing something pretty innovative like that and really get serious about that we really are prioritizing pedestrians here. Uh, so to sum up all of this, I think in general, I certainly am fully, fully supportive of all this pedestrian work. Um, you tell us what resources you need. I think our minds very much focus on this upcoming budget um, between additional resources through procurement or actual dollars to put concrete on the ground. Um, I would love to see all this work move much faster. So thank you for all the hard work. All right, uh, Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The many fine things that I have seen and heard tonight. I think the finest may be the map that showed that the project uh, over on Tenor Hill is being worked on, Tenor Hill and Maple, Tenor Hill and Wallace. Just yesterday, I was walking with the mayor back from the rally, and we were commenting on how, you know, during that stretch of South Maple, it, it's just a really, it reflects extremely poorly on us to have, you know, the situation over there be like it is. And, you know, the historic uh, inequities uh, are just so glaring still. And I'm, I'm really glad to see that that is in particular being addressed. Second, uh, I agree a thousand percent with Vice Mayor Hardy on the Beto's situation. Um, since I was on the Transportation Committee 30 some years ago, that's, you know, been a problem and it just really needs to get addressed. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know it's uh, part of the longer term project and maybe it'll cost us a little extra money to do it but it's just not not forgivable that somebody in some sort of a mobility device i don't know what they would do i mean they, they you can't drive in the street you know if you're on some sort of a scooter or whatever uh, anyway we just we need to get that taken taken care of uh the only question i had uh, uh, was about the prioritization of the hawk signals that slide that you know we can do one or the other D did you mean to say we can do one of the hawk signals or, or we can do the hawk signals or the other group of of, of work it was the entire project so Good. it's okay. yeah so all three hawk signals will be done okay, as great. part of that project well as, as important as the option b is I, I i personally since you asked my opinion would go with the hawk signals because yeah, I mean, that's where the bulk of our problems, the problems all over town, because the nature of false churches is very porous and people are coming and going through it all the time. But on Broad Street, uh, slowing traffic down, getting people to think this is a place where people are going to be walking. And uh, if you're driving, you may just have to stop is, is best communicated, I think, by choosing uh, the hog signals there. Trail crossings are also a problem, too. I acknowledge that. And that trail is, you know, a major thoroughfare. So it's not like it's unimportant. But if I had to choose between the two, I'd pick the first. Um, finally, I've just observed, thank you for everything that you've done. Anybody who thinks that we're not doing enough just needs to sit back and watch this two-hour tape of us deep diving. And we're not even halfway through yet, as far as I can tell. 
So, you know, the city falls church in some form or another, the community has been here for 300 and some years. And for about 275 of those sidewalks were an afterthought. Uh, and, you know, we're not going to be able to get everything done overnight. We're not going to be able to get it done in the next five or even 10 years. We're engaged in generational, maybe multi-generational effort to, you know, turn what is essentially a car oriented suburb into a more pedestrian bicycle and scooter friendly uh, community. And that's just going to take some time. It's not even the money. I think we've got the money to tackle it, but it just takes time. You can't dig up the whole town at once. So thank you for all the work that you're doing and bringing that to us tonight. Thanks. All right, Mr. Kuselson. Dave? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, uh, Cindy and Tara, uh, for that, that great presentation. And everyone uh, on city staff who's involved with uh, NTC, uh, including Jeff, um, yeah, like Jeff said, that was that was a lot of uh, helpful new information. Uh, just a couple of quick notes. One, uh, in the CACT memo to council that uh, we submitted to this meeting, we linked off to some recommendations that we sent last year regarding the uh, creation of a sidewalk and accessibility program that's in the council work plan for 2020 to 2022. Um, so we're happy to uh, go into that. Uh, it's it's uh, at the bottom of the memo. Um, there's a link to uh, to those recommendations. Um, but as Vice Mayor Hardy said, we would love to uh, work with staff and council to help create a uh, sorry, it's up a little bit, I believe, uh, to help sort of create a um, kind of a bottom up uh, program with um, with council and staff to help. Um, uh, help address some of these uh, citizen raised issues. Um, and also we're happy to, uh, it, you know, when the time's right, uh, uh, if you'd like us to walk through uh, some of the recommendations that the CCC put together for pedestrian safety uh, projects as well. Uh, a lot of, there's some overlaps with uh, what, what uh, Tara had shown. Um, and also uh, Councilman Hiscott brought this up, if there's a way that we can help um, add some transparency to the queue in terms of, uh, you know, what ideas are out there, what's been, what's been in the, what, you know, what are some of the ideas that have been uh, in the works for a decade or more? And if there's a way that we can um, uh, centralize some of that information, I know we have the, the neighborhood traffic calming map, uh, but some of these other issues that don't fall neatly into the NTC program, like some of these sidewalks, crosswalk issues, uh, accessibility issues, if there's a place on the city website where we can compile that information. Um, and also just to brag about all of the good work that's been done with some of the NTC projects. Um, I know my neighborhood's been been very happy with yeah, the Great Falls, Little Falls uh, improvements that have been made. Um, and so, and I think also just to help um, you know, citizens and, and TACT understand if there's a way that we can also add some information about the cost of some of the past projects, um, like I, I have no idea what the, the Little Falls, Great Falls project costs. And as we're talking about how to spend the sidewalk um, allocation of the ARPA funds and some of the other money, just so we can get a better understanding of, you know, that crosswalk costs this much to repaint, you know, a Shero costs X dollars. Like if, if we can have, you know, just sort of a, an understanding. Of, and we know we're dealing with the inflationary issues uh, across the board now. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I would also just echo what, what Vice Mayor Hardy said about uh, revisiting uh, Rights on Red. Uh, and I also appreciate what, what Councilman Duncan said about uh, also taking a look at some of these issues through an equity lens. Um, because we know that, you know, like he said, that uh, motor vehicle level of service has been prioritized for many, many years. And as the population of the city booms, you know, we're up 40 plus percent in the last 20 years. Uh, we need to find other ways to get people moving around and, and ensure that we're doing it safely. Um, so thank you all. All right, Mr. Snyder. Dave. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, in listening to all this, there are a couple elements here that I think we need to pursue. Uh, I think the council's interested in whatever f additional funding may be needed. And in traditional highway safety 
considerations, there are really three elements, the vehicle, the driver, and uh, the roadway. So the vehicles are pretty much designed according to federal standards. I'm not sure there's how much we can do there. We talked uh, first about driver, driver behavior, what additional legislation we need. I'm a firm believer in lowering the speed limit, providing additional enforcement, providing effective communication, et cetera, on driving behavior. Then we've been talking about the roadway and here um, a lot of discussion about different elements to make the roadway safer, neighborhood traffic calming and sidewalks. I think the big thing we need is more flexibility than we've seen so far. That is for major efforts and, and neighborhood traffic calming may be appropriate. Uh, but for lesser efforts, I think there's a desire to move more quickly and more nimbly than we've been able to do uh, so far. And finally, with regard to sidewalks, again, I think we've got to be flexible based upon the particular circumstances. It's how we can expand that sidewalk um, in different areas where there are different challenges. So I would just summarize the comments and my thoughts uh, in those ways. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, we do need to keep going. We do have a little more on the transportation agenda, uh, but a few comments uh, and questions from myself. Um, one, what's the per uh, foot linear cost for sidewalk ballpark number for that? Do we have a rough idea what it costs per linear foot? We don't because there's so many different elements at play. So it really depends on if we need to acquire the right of way or if we don't need to acquire the right of way. Um, just for construction costs, we must know that generally what a, a linear foot of just pure sidewalk construction costs about. Yeah, and I don't have that number in front of me, so I wouldn't be able to provide you with that tonight. But we can work that up if we're talking about not you know, needing to acquire any right of way. We can come up with just a cost per linear foot. Of okay. Construction constructed sidewalk. Great. Okay. So I'm um, just a few thoughts. One is to accessibility. Um, I really think that's just a, it's basically a human right to me. It's not something that we can spend you know ten years to to make sure somebody doesn't have to go through the street to walk down uh, you know a block. I really think we need to find a way to accelerate our programs for accessibility. Um, this notion of creating some bump outs here and there for telephone poles, I'd be supportive of that. Um, I do think that some of the best ways to slow people down are just through um, nubs and bump outs and things like that, crosswalks. So I'd be um, uh, supportive of that. Um, something else as well, I think a walking tour with the CACT would be something that would be useful hopefully to all of us, maybe when it gets a bit warmer. Uh, like spring or summer, we could just do a walking tour and sort of look at some of the things we've done, maybe what works, what hasn't worked, or some ideas, things to creatively problem solve. I know I have uh, taken a walk with the uh, chair of CACT about a month ago, and we had a very nice conversation about uh, uh, throughout the whole, we had a pretty long walk. But anyway, I think it's quite helpful. It certainly is to me and maybe to others as well. Uh, but I would recommend maybe we revisit our conversation um, when it gets a bit warmer for a um, a uh, joint uh, walking tour. Also just a comment about ramps, sidewalk ramps at the intersections. Um, a lot of them end up just having one in the middle, like a diagonal where you've got someone who wants to go on one street and there's another crosswalk perpendicular, but then there's, there's no crosswalk on either side. We just picked one in the middle to split the difference. I have to say, I think that's sort of unacceptable in a lot of ways. You have handicapped people who may have to go out into the road to sort of go straight across. And so I would just encourage us to to give some more thought about some of our standards. And I don't know, those may have been before, you know, most recent days, but there are plenty of them if you, if you walk around where the ramp just sort of goes in the middle. It just, you know, like splits the baby. And I, I'm not sure it works. Um, so uh, anyway, I'd also like to even discuss going further, just the placement of things as we do even new construction. So a lot of what we're talking about what's there is built 50 years ago. Nobody cared about pedestrians then. But even on some of our new projects, I think we need to sort of revisit how we group things so that uh, obstructions aren't sort of spread out among our very nice setback, but actually grouped so that we can have some real clear walking space. Uh, but I think those are things that might be good, again, for a walking tour. But just some general thoughts. I think we're doing some great work. I think you can hear there's consensus among all of us to accelerate the pace 
of what we're doing. Um, so thank you for your good work. I think we have one more subtopic here, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on the transportation agenda. Is that right? Mr. We Shields? do. We have uh, Scott Freda and um, Scott, maybe we you could uh, jump in now and um, introduce the South Maple and Annandale project. And we have our design consultant on the call as well. And before you get started, I might just suggest that when this uh, item is through, we'll probably be about 9.30, we take ourselves a short break um, so that people can refresh and then get back at it. So unless anyone has any objection, uh, I would just suggest we take a short recess after this last bit. But uh, welcome, welcome to you all. And we'd love to hear about some of your thoughts on this uh, new proposal. Good evening, everybody. My name is Scott Farida. I'm the CIP project manager here at the DPW for Falls Church. For this particular project that we're getting ready to look at right now, it's the intersection of South Maple Street and, and um, Annadale Road. And um, we were tasked to um, prepare, have our um, design contract prepare preliminary design analysis last year to um, give this information to help decide if we wanted to move forward with a upgraded signalized intersection with full pedestrian signalization or um, transfer it, um, transform it to a roundabout. Um, documents from the city's traffic, um, the traffic analysis from years ago, I think it was from 2005, if somebody, if somebody might want to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, this proposed a tra proposed a traffic roundabout for this particular intersection, and so we followed through with the analysis for our um, contract to do anal analyze both. So I'll give you a little bit of background information. Um, this past year, in the spring, um, our contractor RDA um, prepared a preliminary design analysis, which gave us information backing up both types of um, options here: the signalized intersection as well as the roundabout. Um, I'm going to skip all the technical details, but basically, after reviewing the pre preliminary design analysis, the city staff chose to move forward with the roundabout intersection for several reasons, mainly because uh, it was a safer um, design. Uh, it would definitely um, calm traffic a lot better than a traditional signalized intersection, and the costs for the long-term maintenance of the project was a lot less. Um, for this design, um, we had Rinker design, Rinker um, RDA prepare a 60% design analysis, which we um, just recently reviewed in September. And right now we're basically in the stage where they're preparing a 90% design um, submission. And that's why we wanted to go ahead and give you a courtesy uh, presentation, just to let you know that we were planning on um, doing what would be considered the first roundabout in the city. So since that was the case, we wanted to give you a little heads up for this project that's upcoming shortly. And you can see the time frame involved in front of you on the um, screen. So like we're prob probably be getting our 90% design review probably sometime by the end of this month, early February. And um, with that, I'd like to turn this presentation over to our uh, design consultant, RDA, and John Giametti is here to give us a little bit more information, a little bit more technical background, a little, a little bit more of a deeper dive than I just gave you. I just kind of gave you the quick nuts and bolts. So, John, if you want to take over from now. Hi, right, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Council, for uh, uh, inviting us tonight to uh, uh, present. Uh, on, on your screen there is a... Uh, <clears throat> exhibit showing the roundabout design to <clears throat> excuse me to try to orient you um, uh, South Maple is running uh, left to right uh, and Annandale Road is running up and down uh, West Broad Street would be on the right side of your screen and the one city center is uh, in the bottom right hand corner of the intersection um, so what you have currently today, you, uh, South Maple is a three-lane approach to the intersection signed at 25 miles an hour, whereas Annandale is a four-lane approach, uh, again, uh, speed limit of 25 miles an hour. With the roundabout, we take both roadways down to 
uh, a, a two lane approach into the intersection. Uh, it does a variety of things for us. It, it allows uh, traffic calming as uh, Scott had mentioned, but it really shortens the distance that pedestrians have to cross the road. Uh, the other thing it does for the pedestrians is uh, instead of having to look in multiple direct directions for possible conflicts with vehicles, they only have to look in one direction and they have a refuge in the center of the road uh, where, where they can stop again and, and look and cross. So they can cross in two stages, whereas with a signalized in intersection, they, they really need the, the gap to be long enough so that they can cross the, the full full length uh, at once. Uh, safety is, as Scott mentioned, was one of the things that, uh, you know, a uh, reason why roundabouts get, get chosen uh, over a signal when, when the operational characteristics are, are otherwise equal, which is the case here. Uh, so I uh, also like to point out uh, the, the project will widen the sidewalks in the area to 14 feet, uh, include hardscape and streetscape uh, amenities. Uh, the corner of the bo the bowling alley that's in your upper left-hand corner, uh, we are widening that sidewalk to eight feet, but we are limited, uh, trying not to impact the uh, parking. Uh, so eight feet is about as wide as we could get and would even require a small retaining wall. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, um, there's a summary of some of the things we, we considered. Scott uh, hit on some of those in, in the introduction, but uh, the roundabout, when comparing it to the signal, provides superior vehicle safety, pedestrian safety, environmental impacts as you, know, you have less pavement, more opportunities for green space. Um, Construction cost tends to be a little bit more, but it's competitive, but you're, you're, you do get that money back in long, long term uh, life cycle costs uh, for maintenance. Um, next slide, I wanted to show you a little something as it uh, relates to why a roundabout is safer than a signalized intersection. And here it shows the different conflict points uh, that vehicles and pedestrians have in a roundabout versus an intersection. So uh, a roundabout provides uh, four times less vehicle conflicts and three times less conflicts for pedestrians. Now, a uh, question came up in the, uh, in, in, in the CACT uh, um, meeting last week about bicyclists. Well, uh, bicyclists have the same uh, advantage for safety as a, a vehicle uh, because a bicyclist has the same number of conflict points as a vehicle does in how they navigate both a traditional signalized intersection and roundabout. Uh, so it ends up being being safer for, for all modes um, when you go with a roundabout. Uh, next slide, I wanted to show uh, the effect of traffic calming that you have uh, on pedestrian safety. Uh, the roundabout that we've designed has a maximum geometric speed of 20 miles an hour. Now that wouldn't necessarily be the comf most comfortable speed to go through the roundabout, but if someone uh, were, were approaching the roundabout and there was no other cars uh, coming, uh, and they didn't have to slow down, they could navigate the roundabout at 20 miles an hour. And as you can see, just increasing to 30 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour, which wouldn't be uncommon uh, with your traditional signalized intersection, the, the chances of a pedestrian to survive those kind of impacts grow dramatically from the 20 miles an hour that you would experience with a roundabout. With that, I'm open up to any questions or comments uh, that you might have. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start with some questions and comments. Jason? 
Hi, yes, uh, thank you. Um, so I just have a couple of uh, general comments about the roundabout in general uh, and the, the ability for the city to kind of use this as an example. Um, so I would encourage the city to consider this intersection as a huge opportunity to demonstrate uh, commitment to broader equity and accessibility goals uh, through the encouragement of the use of other non-automobile modes. You know, a standard roundabout on its own may not necessarily increase any substantial confidence in cycling, as an example, as a transportation option in the city uh, due to the lack of protective facilities and, and user uncertainty. Um, I don't think that just because protected bike facilities aren't necessarily required for a roundabout in this environment means that the city shouldn't consider them. Um, while I appreciate the cost and space constraints may drive some design decisions for the roundabout, hopefully doing this in conjunction with a potential one city center project may potentially allow for a bit more flexibility for the width necessary uh, for protected bike facilities. And I think this is a real opportunity to be a catalyst uh, for more comprehensive bike facility planning uh, that can take the 2015 bicycle master plan to the next level and really build out a connected network uh, in thoughtful ways. Um, I, I would also encourage uh, the city to include accessible pedestrian signals or other flashers or beacons at a potential roundabout, as they can be more challenging for the visually impaired or those in wheelchairs, uh, since there is not a signalized pedestrian crossing phase. Uh, and therefore, you know, they're more reliant on vehicles or, or drivers respecting uh, the pedestrian right of way in the crosswalk. Um, and, and that's one of the biggest concerns that I've heard uh, from other residents is, you know, concern regarding driver failure to potentially yield to pedestrian right away in the crosswalks at the roundabout and the concern with pedestrians getting gaps to cross since traffic is free flowing. Uh, so I think that there's a lot that, that can be done to make those uh, pedestrian signals more visible with the, the flashing beacons and things like that to, to give more confidence to, to the pedestrians uh, using the facility. Uh, and the last thing I'd just like to bring up, and we talked about this in the CACT meeting um, with the design consultant last uh, week, we just wanted to bring up the, the truck turning movements uh, in the roundabout, given the location as it relates to the existing Harris Teeter, uh, but also the potential future grocery store associated with the one city center development, uh, just making sure that the uh, appropriate trucks are considered for the for design purposes to make sure that we're not restricting or limiting uh, deliveries to those to those grocery stores. Um, uh, and that's that's all I had. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments? So um, Ms. Con Ms. Connolly and then Ms. Hardy. Thanks, Mary Charity. Along uh, along the same lines, I'm just wondering about bicycle access and how does bicycle access work at a roundabout? Okay, there, there, there's two recommended ways to uh, uh, handle bicyclists uh, with a roundabout. One is to exit them onto the sidewalk and let them mix with the pedestrians and cross uh, in, in the same areas that the pedestrians cross. Uh, the other is to, uh, in the case where you have bike lanes on the road like we have, is that you merge them into the uh, traffic, vehicle traffic that's using the, the roundabout. Uh, we chose or are currently considering uh, the, the latter option uh, only because uh, the, the sidewalks uh, that, that are being considered, you know, will have, have a great deal of hardscape and streetscape amenities that, that wouldn't exactly be conducive to uh, exiting a bicyclist onto the sidewalk. Um, also, given it's a one-lane roundabout, it's easier to, to navigate for a bicyclist uh, merging with traffic as opposed to if this was a, a two-lane or, or hybrid type of roundabout. All right, Ms. Hardy. I had the same question about how we were going to um, have bikes there because that stretch of Maple is really one of the few stretches of dedicated bike lane that we have. And I'd hate to have bikes uh, hop on the sidewalk and mix with pedestrians if it's possible in the design to think about how to keep them separate and still protected from the car traffic. I think, do you think it's an important example of how we can support all modes of transportation here? All right, Mr. Snyder.
Yes, um, I would urge everyone to refer to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and their discussion of roundabouts. Um, they uh, basically conclude that roundabouts are a safer alternative to traffic signals and stop signs. And um, they've conducted a number of studies and reports. So rather than express opinions, I think we really ought to go to the experts uh, for this. And that particular organization is the one most noted for the crashing the cars and the, um, the, um, their work has led to much safer high uh, car designs but they also have some expertise on design of highways based upon insurance data and other data. So I would urge everyone as they're studying this issue to make reference to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and simply Google that, IIHS and roundabouts, and you'll get their, um, their studies and their reports. And I think they're worthy of serious consideration as we move forward on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leon. Yeah, thank you so much for um, all the information here. I think from uh, from my perspective, having walked um, in Washington, D.C., um, Boston, cities that use a lot of roundabouts, uh, the one thing that we want to make sure we factor in here to support the, the pedestrian safety and just safety overall is signage. Um, it's amazing how when a driver is presented with a roundabout, um, you know, it's not naturally inherent um, uh, around how that flow works, which direction are you looking at? Um, you know, for those that are turning right um, with a pedestrian crosswalk right there, you want to make sure that even though there's a medium um, and there's, uh, you know, um, the surface of that crosswalk might look different than the road. Um, you know, there's still potential for confusion. So as we take a look at practical implementation of this, um, I, I definitely think signage um, and considering supporting, um, since this would be the first uh, roundabout in the city that we, we promote the safety that we want with this. And also, just to be clear, which parts of this have eight foot sidewalks? Is it uh, just the Bowl of America side or is it the side across from Bowl of America too, whereas everything else is 13 feet? Uh, just the Bowl of America side, all just, the other quadrants okay. are, are 14 foot wide. Okay, 14, okay. Thank you. Mr. Duncan. Thank you. So the uh, through line uh, width is, is it, I'm looking at the piece of paper, is it 11 foot? Is it an 11 foot through line for the traffic? 12, 12 foot. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm not seeing, looks like it's, well, it looks like it's rendered as 11 on the, on the diagram that I have, but uh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think I, would like to see maybe just a little bit more elbow room for the bike and the car. I don't want to make that uh, lane over wide, but maybe another foot. Uh, so it's my understanding that the applicant for the one city center Atlantic Realty is agnostic about this. They're willing to, as part of their development, to uh, see this or a traditional intersection go in. So if we decide to go with a roundabout, that's okay with them. Is that your understanding? Yeah, that's yeah, our understanding. Yep, yeah, this this is a uh, uh, staff has been making sure the developer is well aware of this plan, and and uh and they um are are building accordingly. You know, or, okay. or planning. I'm sorry, planning accordingly. Okay, so if we needed an extra foot here or there, that it would be timely to do it in conjunction with the uh, uh, one city center application. Uh, finally, the lighting. Uh, I'm again, looking at the diagrams, seems to me like uh, a lot of our pedestrian safety problems are uh, visibility uh, at night problems, and we obviously hope that this area is going to be 
of the very heart of a, a highly walked uh, area from, uh, you know, uh, Broad and Washington all the way down to uh, Tenor Hill. Uh, when this finally gets built out and the whole area is developed as, as we plan for it to be. So are we making plans to put in, you know, extra street lights uh, of the traditionally uh, architecturally pleasing kind uh, rather than the industrial sort of, uh, you know, cobra head ones uh, as part of this uh, part of this project? I, yes, uh, um, for, for roundabouts, one, one, one of the things that they require is illumination uh, at night. Uh, unlike a uh, signalized intersection uh, where your headlights are directly tracking with your destination or roundabout, uh, your, your headlights are not tracking with your destination. So it's important as you enter the roundabout to be able to see what where you're looking to, to exit. So um, that's why we often uh, put uh, lighting uh, in, in roundabouts, but they'll be the decorative kind uh, and they will blend with, with the other uh, pedestrian street lighting that's being proposed as part of the one center. Uh, Good, okay. Aesthetically, the decorative is important. Practically, as you indicate, you know, they need to have a highly functional uh, 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 profile also for just the reasons you explained. I'm glad we've thought about that already. I think these things will work great during the daylight hours. Nighttime is uh, highly dependent on uh, lighting and visibility. And so let's make sure that we do address that. Okay, thanks. All right, other comments? Um, if not, I have one or two. I have to say I'm a bit skeptical about uh, roundabouts. Um, I do think there's not very many in Northern Virginia on fairly major streets or plenty in residential streets in Arlington, but I don't think most um, traffic goers are that um, conversant with just the patterns and how things work and who yields to who. Um, and so uh, in some ways they may technically be safer, but. I think having just one of a few of these in on a fairly major street actually could be more dangerous. Um, I also think that a lot of things we're talking about for pedestrian and bike safety could also be accomplished through just a traditional intersection. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm not saying I'm against it. I, I guess I'm just saying I'm not sold on it yet and would like to hear more about it um, and how it might compare to a traditional intersection. Um, so that's kind of what I got. And unless anyone else has anything, I think we've gone three times longer than we had allocated for this discussion, which has been great, but we are going to have to, um, increase the pace, accelerate the pace. Jason, did you have a comment? I'm sorry. I, it looked like your hand went down, but it looks like it's back up. I'll, I'll go ahead and give you a last word on this. No, no, no problem. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. I just had one other, uh, comment that kind of goes back to my theme, uh, from earlier about the city taking these opportunities to you know, as as few and far between as they may come to really think big about utilizing the opportunities to demonstrate, you know, commitment to equity and accessibility goals uh, through the encouragement of non-auto modes. And just to, you know, try to apply that thinking as well to other projects. The one in particular that I was thinking of was the Park Avenue Great Street. Uh, I'm really trying to to start with a blank slate and reprioritize the use of other modes rather than trying to trim away at the edges uh, with the design that's still centered around the car. And that we should be trying to look to do everything that we can with these limited opportunities that we may get uh, to to further some of those goals through the the application or the the reprioritization of of the use of different modes to encourage uh, multi truly multimodal travel within the city. Thank you. Uh huh. Thank you. Um, so with that, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a recess, if that's okay with everybody. It's 9:43. I'm going to reconvene. We'll reconvene at 9:50. And at that time, we will accelerate, hopefully, the pace of our conversation so we can get out of here before our meeting tomorrow morning. Um, so let's go ahead and reconvene at 9.50. If we can, thank you for all our folks who have joined us. We look forward to getting back together with you very soon. Thank you.
some of us. Yes, indeed. Gets All right, thank you. So should we wait uh, 40 seconds from now? All right, good to go, let's go. So let's move on to the next item on the agenda, which is transition zones. Uh, Mr. Stoddard, are you handling this, or who's uh, going to be discussing this from a staff perspective, right when you put the food in your mouth? I am. I do have the honor of making the staff presentation tonight on this item. Uh, and with that, I'll get in the way, unless, Mr. Manager, if you want to make a brief introduction. Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Stoddard. Please proceed. All right, will do. Uh, thank you, Mayor Tarter, members of council, for having me back to discuss this item. Uh, I'm going to step through some of this is new, some of this is old. Where it's old, I'll step over it. Where it's new, I'll go into a little more detail. Uh, the request section, beginning on line three, the request is for council to provide direction tonight uh, on uh, potential possible amendments to uh, the two transitional zoning districts in the city, T1 and T2. Uh, largely what staff has brought forward before uh, and, is, and is looking to do uh, more formally at the next work session uh, with draft zoning code uh, would be to revise the allowable uses in T1 to remove uh, one uh, single family development as a buy right option consolidate the two districts that would be consistent with what ZOAC had recommended the zoning uh, review committee had, had recommended several years ago uh, and to allow for a new form of residential infill development uh, and I know as we get into the weeds of a zoning ordinance it can be easy to lose sight of why we started this conversation in the first place uh, and so this is captured in the background but I thought I'd mention it here the the intent here is really to look for ways the city can provide for a new housing type uh, something that otherwise isn't permissible in any of the city's zoning districts. So you can do single family development in the R districts uh, and in the in the uh, in the planning opportunity areas through the SE process uh, is how housing providers, housing developers have been able to construct five story, six story buildings that are multifamily housing on multi acre sites. Uh, but really, this is looking at those smaller infill sites, something less than an acre where you're looking for a smaller scale of development. Uh, recommendation tonight, uh, as I said, staff is looking for guidance uh, as it begins the process of actually drafting uh, some zoning text. Uh, let's see, beginning on line 13, uh, the new information in this report, staff has added data on recent residential condominium proposals in the city, uh, as well as residential infill projects from across the region. Uh, as I said, uh, next step will be for staff to provide um, draft zoning text and after that text is provided and reviewed by council is when staff would begin the engagement process and you can see on line 16 through 18 we've called out some potential stakeholders including property owners adjacent neighbors uh, development community boards and commissions uh, as well as the general public uh, background section on line 20 as a reminder this really got a kick off when council adopted the changes to the se the special exception criteria in february of 2021 as part of that amendment, council had directed staff to come up with zoning changes that would allow for to facilitate, I'm sorry, that would facilitate uh, development of smaller residential infill projects. Uh, council held work sessions beginning on line 29 and 30. Council held work sessions on previous dates in June of 21, as well as November of 21. Uh, and really those conversations focused on the key levers within a zoning ordinance uh, and when staff staff is requesting guidance. These are really the levers we're looking for feedback on, the allowable uses in a building, uh, the, the building design, the programming of the building. Uh, uh, does it have to be multi-use? Can it be single use? Uh, how tall can the building be? Site design, how much lot coverage can you have? What do the setbacks need to be? Uh, and then also some procedural items, as I mentioned, district consolidation 
in total, the T1 and T2 uh, zones have about 30 acres of total land in the city or 3% of the city's total land area. Uh, and then the review process. Uh, so previously, staff has suggested making multifamily a buy right option. Uh, and just for just for code reference, there is a buy right option uh, in the T zones today that allows for use of the MUR overlay. Uh, for folks that aren't familiar with it, the MUR was put in several years ago as an overlay zoning district that that developers would have an option of using. Uh, it's rarely been used. Most folks have found it uh, cumbersome or, or too tightly drawn to, to, uh, to work economically. Uh, so just to highlight, there is that option today for buy right multifamily, uh, although because of the constraints and considerations, it, it hasn't been successfully used. Um, let's see, 66 is uh, detailing of what's currently allowed in T1 and T2 zoning. Uh, this has been discussed previously, so I'll skip over it, except for the map on line 78, uh, just to familiarize everyone again with where the T zones are located in the city. They're, they're circled in purple. Uh, they run along West Broad Street, North Washington, South Washington, uh, and then there are two pockets along Hillwood, uh, one there and then one further out near Roosevelt. Uh, jumping to line 95, there's some summary data on existing townhouses along Park Avenue. Uh, this was also discussed at your last work session, so I'll skip over this. Uh, line 103, new information. These are uh, This is a summary of recent condominium proposals. So this was a question that came up at the last work session. Uh, what were the what were the data on the recent condo proposals that ultimately were not approved? So in 2015 and 2017, uh, there were two applications that came in, uh, first at the corner of West Broad and Spring, and then the other at the corner of Lee and Park. Uh, and ultimately, uh, it was considered that these projects did not meet the standards for approval of an SE. Uh, uh, as part of the conversation, noted shortcomings included uh, lack of significant net new commercial space, uh, just a reminder, that was an old consideration in the SC code that was that has since been removed. Uh, and then also there was a lack of appropriate design transition down to the single family zonings uh, behind it. And by down, I mean large in height. Um, and of course, a building size is always driven by a number of things. Uh, and of course, making it uh, uh, making it economically feasible is, is a real driver here. So that's, that's one of the big questions about these smaller sites. Uh, if we can go to the next page, there's a table beginning on line 118, uh, and this runs through some of these summary statistics for the for the projects that were not approved in the city. Uh, you can see the site size was in both cases about 0.7 acres. The residential density varied from about 90 units to 100 units to the acre. Commercial space varied. In one case, it was about 30,000 square feet, uh, and another just short of, of 12,000, but that was with a mix of live work units. Uh, and then the building heights were tall. They were 85 feet and 70 feet. And then lot coverage varied from 66 to 87 uh, percent. And a lot of that lot coverage, just to throw this out, had to do with the shape of the lots. Uh, on the Park and Lee proposal, it's it's a fairly square uh, parcel, so it was easy to fit a rectangular building on it. Uh, broad and string, it was more of a, a, a uh, sort of a, a parallelogram. And so you, you drop a rectangle on a parallelogram lot and you end up with uh, sort of leftover triangles on the sides. So knowing that those projects were not positively viewed under the SC criteria, uh, city staff looked for examples of residential infill projects from elsewhere in the region. Uh, we picked four examples just uh, for comparison's sake. Uh, and there is more information on these uh, in your attachments, including uh, renderings or images of the, the projects, but I don't want to jump to those now. Uh, but here they are, the, the four projects, they're all located in Alexandria, uh, Robinson Landing, Dillon, Delray Place, and Abingdon. Uh, and if you look, uh, we tried to compile the same data, at least as best we could, uh, for comparison's sake. And you can see the two projects on the left, Robinson and Dillon, are larger in parcel size, 4.1 acres and 1.7 acres. Uh, those are also taller in terms of building height, five and six stories. So that's largely consistent with uh, what the city's seeing in terms of its, its height and parcel sizes for the larger redevelopments. Uh, the two projects on the right, the Delray Place and the Abington, are smaller in size, uh, about half an acre in size. Uh, and they're about four stories in height. Uh, one of them has no commercial space, and then the other has a, a small retail space on the front. 
Uh, and so these are called out by staff just as example projects. And maybe after the staff report, we'll be able to jump to those images. Uh, this is line 127, zoning code areas for review. These are just to call these to council's attention. There are no, as I said, there are no suggested edits to these sections tonight. Uh, but if we can scroll down, I just wanted to call out, these are largely the sections uh, that city staff would be recommending changes to. Uh, for the T1 zone, it's, it's the principal uses permitted by right. You can see it's a lengthy list and we would recommend changes to that, uh, as well as the T2. Uh, and then I think the other primary place where we'd be recommending changes, there's a table that should follow. There it is. Uh, this is a table that summarizes things like uh, building heights and setbacks and lot coverage limits. Uh, and as staff prepares for the next work session on this item, we would uh, include recommended changes to these to this table. Uh, maybe we can jump. I think that's the end of the staff report. So maybe we could jump to that attachment just for illustrative purposes to look at those other projects. It should be not that attachment. Uh, this one, yes. So this is again the same summary table as was in the staff report. And if we scroll down to the images, uh, let's see, there's the map, the project location. So this is one of the larger projects. Uh, if we keep going, the second one will also be one of the larger projects, uh, which I think is largely not what the council is looking for on these T sites, uh, but we included it for an example comparison. But, but these two projects here, so this is Delray Place, which is a smaller project. Uh, as well as the next one as well. The Abingdon project is, is also a smaller project. So maybe we'll leave these up uh, for purposes of council discussion. But that conclu concludes my staff report and I'm happy to field questions uh, and, and uh, get some guidance. Thank All you. right, thank you very much. Um, we do have some hands up. Uh, before we, we get to the, the various uh, conversation and comments, I guess I would just sort of try to shape the the conversation. I'm not sure we're going to get to the bottom of this tonight, so I think it might be given the hour and what we still have left in the agenda to be good, just have expectations that we're going to give some general comments with the idea that this will not be resolved tonight and sort of in its final shape, but give you some general um, uh, feedback that you can take and work from there. So with that in mind, let's start with Mr. Duncan. <clears throat> Thank you. So as I read line 15, why we're here tonight is to tell staff whether we want them to prepare a draft of a zoning code text amendment for our review. My answer to that is yes. Um, my question is, what's your timetable? If, if that is the will of this group tonight, are we thinking that's something that we would see in the next uh, three weeks, five weeks, six weeks? What's, Paul, what's your estimated time of arrival uh three weeks feels short uh we've got a we got a staff outage and a vacancy uh and our most of our zoning experts are, are working on development projects right now uh so three weeks is probably short but but i think five weeks uh, seven weeks is probably too long to come back to council so i, I think we'll look for a work session to between that that three week mark and that seven week mark <clears throat> okay, well, that would suit me fine. The question that I wanted to pose had to do with the height and the lot coverage. So as I look at the two proposals that we <clears throat> had here in Falls Church, the 85-foot version, which covered 66% of the land, and the 70-foot version that covered 87%. So that suggests to me that uh, the taller the building is, the more envelope space there is around it. Uh, or can be around it, and then have it still be an economically, you know, survivable proposal. Um, my two cents is that I would rather see the heights go down, uh, and I'm willing to make the trade-off on the envelope. So, to me, I don't know, 45 feet sounds like not quite enough. I mean, if if you're building a, a smaller boutique kind of building, or what's what ceiling heights are you looking at? Are you looking at eight or nine foot ceilings? If it's if it's nine foot ceilings and the first story has any lift to it at all, you're you're going to get closer to 50 feet. I just wonder how you arrive at the 45 foot number in your staff report. The 45 foot number, I think, was borrowed from what's allowable in T today. So where this proposal had started was a largely allow for the same building form that's allowable in buy right commercial and then just translate that building form to residential. 
uh, I think you're right uh, that as part of translating this from commercial to residential, you also need to make sure that you got the floor heights right. Uh, I think in, in new residential projects, you're lock, probably looking at at least a nine foot ceiling uh, for all the upper stories, uh, if not a little bit taller uh, for some headroom. Uh, and then of course, a slightly taller ground floor as well for, for some sense of entry. Okay, well, my two cents then is gonna be to suggest 50 feet and the envelope, uh, I would say, could go up to 90%, given that the, we had a 70-foot building that covered 87% of the land. I'm, I'm not sure whether this is going to be economically feasible or not, but I would, I would say a 50-foot height and a 90% uh, lot coverage uh, might be you know, what, what we might hope that the market would bring to us. And finally... Uh, why we are engaged in this activity is well expressed in your staff report where it says we want to achieve a diverse housing stock. Very proud of all the many good things that this council has done, but I think we have to admit that one area where we've come up short so far is figuring out what to do with these smaller parcels, which basically remain chronically unimproved at a time when everything else in town is booming. So I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, what can we do to make those chronically unimproved, underperforming uh, parcels um, something that contributes to the vibrant scene that we're creating here in town? So that's why I would like to see us move forward on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Uh, Leon. I echo Phil. Um, I'm really looking forward um, to continuing our focus on supporting our um, FCC community and creating and activating spaces that bring community together, um, that support accessibility, equitable outcomes, and absolutely increasing the affordable housing um, stock available in the city. And re-examining the use of T-zones is a very important um, toolkit for us to accomplish um, all of those things, and I'm very supportive. So my feedback is going to sit along four points. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of uh, past five years um, wearing my um, affordable housing hat at Freddie Mac and have taken a look at uh, infill um, in those five years and what makes it successful, what makes it not successful in multiple cities across the country. Um, I think um, the dwelling coverage um, is very important. You cannot set it to 40 percent. I think I saw a table um, that referenced that number that is just not um, feasible. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of money and not get the outcomes that we want because we can't get the right development partner um, uh, from a, a lot coverage perspective. Um, I, I, you know, what's worked in a lot of cities and we can connect uh, you to multiple cities around this that have done this is more like a minimum, you know, uh, 75, around 75 or 80 percent coverage. Right. So it supports some. Um, uh, some green spaces uh, as well. So um, I think we need to acknowledge that infill carries higher development costs on both sides, developer, the city. Um, it's got less economies of scale. You need to protect those adjacent properties. You've got existing roads and utilities that have to be retrofitted or replaced, um, which at times is more costly than building new ones. So we, there's going to be demand that exists for new housing and close-in communities, and to get the right um, interest in it, we've got to make it economically viable for both sides, and it needs higher dwelling coverages. Um, for height, I think uh, we need to take a look at um, what Alexandria has done. If you take a look at Abingdon, the 0.6 acres, uh, there's the notion of aerial step backs that is different than a setback um, to offset um, the transition from, you know, the single family residential um, into the multifamily side. So uh, taking a look at height, right, um, and plugging in the equation with dwelling coverage, whether it's 50 feet for four stories or, you know, um, three stories at, 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 at less than that, I think we need to take a look at that and explore it. Um, I think it's dangerous to institute a parking requirement. Um, we take pride that we're a walkable city. And I hear us say that we want to support a carbon footprint reduction effort. So let's support that by not mandating a minimum of warm parking space. 
I think what I've seen, well, I, what I know, um, the new thinking in cities that I've seen on this, instead of setting parking requirements, they accompany codes like this um, with other considerations, such as offsite parking arrangements um, versus mandating um, parking. And one more, I think we need to be careful around um, mandating commercial or retail. Uh, what, what approach we should take is looking at what is progressive in thinking um, without being overly restrictive, um, yet it's proactive to what it is we're trying to do. So I do think we need to reconsider examining the categories of non-residential that are allowed in those T-zones. You've got two columns, T1, T2. You know, for example, do we really want hotels, motels, and breakfast allowed in the code that we're trying to merge? Is that really, you know, the kind of aspects that we are looking for to help create community in these T-zones? Um, so I do think in the proposal, we've got to make sure that we're very tight when it comes to the first reading what exactly is allowed, right, against the current checklist that's in the exhibits and in the back of this. So I know that was a lot, but um, thanks for putting together this report, but I've um, got a lot of thoughts on it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hiscott. Yeah, thanks. I'm just trying to call my notes here between what um, Phil and Caroline just shared, because they shared a lot of the things that I was thinking about. Um, I had a question for Paul. Of that 3% uh, that fit in T1 and T2 zones right now, I know a lot of them are, uh, a lot of that space is covered by things like um, Christ Crossman Church, the Sunrise Senior Living Center, the Miller House. Like, so like I just kind of mentally am walking down uh, Washington, for instance, and I'm just trying to get a, um, get my handle, get a handle on knowing which of these lots is really what we're talking about. I mean, how many of these would we really be discussing? Obviously, by right, you could can, could change that at any point in time. You need to consider that. But realistically, for our near, mid, and longer term, the uses on at least that section of Washington are going to change. Do you have a sense for, of that, you know, 3%, th uh, what, 30? Just lost the number of acres. It's about there. 30 acres. About 30? Yeah, I don't, uh, I, just walking through these bubbles uh, off the cuff here, I think you're right, the North Washington parcels, uh, that is that almost that entire block, uh, was that west of North Washington Street uh, is owned um, uh, by the church and is unlikely to, to, to change um, the, uh, in the short term, the, uh, the properties to the east of Washington Street, similarly, are under the control of a, uh, of a um, house of worship as well as um, the sunrise, as you mentioned. So there are a limited number of parcels in there that might be open for redevelopment. Uh, over by the 24-hour fitness site, they might be able to do something creative with that frontage uh, that wouldn't require a rezoning. Uh, currently, I think if they wanted to redevelop, they, they'd be sort of driven to a rezoning. Uh, same thing along Hillwood Avenue for those two parcels in there. Uh, the small properties along South Washington are probably in the same spot. Uh, and then working back in uh, along West Broad, uh, the circle over by West Street, that's that's currently uh, being considered for a rezoning to allow for some redevelopment potential with the Founders 2 project. Uh, and then Park Avenue, I think, is largely the sites people think about when they think about T-zones. But like I said, the, the same infill opportunities along Park could be present along South Washington, Hillwood, and uh, Roosevelt. All right. Oh, I'm sorry, you're muted, Council Member. Apologies. Uh, so it, it is a pretty narrow band there. Um, and you had diagrams of the two groups on uh, of housing on Park Avenue. Then Park in Pennsylvania. There's. Yeah, the two townhouses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're, and then at the corner of Park and Pennsylvania is just further down from those as well. And that yes. multi-story. Sorry, go ahead. I was just looking back to the overall map where that fits in, and that is 
already at four stories? Uh, so this uh, this Im this satellite image here that's at the corner of uh, whoops. Yeah, no, I don't. I didn't see the park in Pennsylvania on that. On the. Uh, oh, this is the edge of the. I'm trying to orient myself here. And in that example in Alexandria, I'm switching back to that one again uh, because it kind of feels like that's what is most appropriate, most fitting for our um, area. Like looking at setbacks there. I didn't see setbacks on the chart. I know there are different zoning there because of, yeah, the one right below it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you have an estimate of, like, when you're talking about setbacks, how that relates to the setbacks we're talking to? Uh, we don't have estimates of, of setbacks for this. We were uh, doing what we could off of uh, project websites and, and the City of Alexandria website. I think that that's something we get in more detail. Uh, I can actually see a hand up from, from Jim Snyder, who may be familiar with some of the project setbacks there. Yes, uh, this project has a variety of setbacks because it's a collection of buildings that are connected. It doesn't look like one building. And one portion of the buildings have small front yards for ground level, one bedroom studio apartments with units above that. That's the gray building you see on the left hand side. So the setbacks vary depending on the design. Very creatively done project. Yeah. I guess Ben, you're going back to looking, you know, at infill and what what feedback you're looking to from us. Like that's something mm -hmm. that I see happening in Falls Church City. In terms of shaping it. Looks like lots of others have questions. I'll stop there for a moment. Mr. Snyder. David Snyder. Thank you. Um, so one thing I've learned the hard way when you hurry zoning code changes, you create all kinds of unintended consequences that sometimes you live with for decades. So I favor a more deliberate approach here. Um, I'm very concerned about lumping all the T zones together, um, treating them all the same because not all T zones are the same. They're in fact very different in characteristics, in size, where they're located, what they're surrounded by. So I would oppose a buy right if the council wants to consider some degree of flexibility based upon the particular context of a particular property, then that's something I'm willing to consider. But I strongly oppose a buy right approach where you lump together all T zones as though they're the same. And in fact, just looking at this map, and, and I would like to see an overhead view of each one of these T zones so we can have a much better idea about what's there and what we're really authorizing. With respect to diversity and housing style, uh, types, I have to say, we've had the authority to mandate diversity in housing types in these major developments, and yet collectively we've been willing to live with one housing type, which are apartments. So you'll have to excuse me, but the failure to have diversity in housing is not something that should justify um, wholesale changes in our zoning code speed it up. Um, without careful consideration of the surrounding areas, the effects on neighborhoods, and the, um, the other key aspects. So I don't support a buy right approach. I am willing to look at this, um, but remember what happened to our interest in tree canopies and maintaining and controlling stormwater. I guess that all disappeared in the desire to create more development uh, of residential development, which is something I'm not really sure we need or this type if we ex exercised our full leverage capability with some of these developments that frankly actually are now even in front of us. So I guess I question, I challenge the absolute need. I'm willing to look at flexibility, but it needs to be done, it seems to me, by T-zone by T-zone so that we don't have unintended consequences and I do not support a buy right approach for this. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Hardy. Thank you. Um, Paul, if I'm looking at this um, map correctly, is the only T2 zone the one where Kaiser is? So really, we're just looking at T1s for the most part? 
That's darker purple is the T2? Uh, I, uh, I, know that, that <laughs> I know there aren't a lot of acreages of these things, but, but at this scale, I'm a little nervous about answering that, but I, but I think you're probably right. Okay. So I hear Mr. Snyder's concern that, you know, not all T-zones are the same, but if realistically, pretty much they're all T1 except the Kaiser building, and that one's probably not going away in a long, long time. Um, I'm less concerned about that. Um, so I certainly, and we've discussed this a lot, um, I'm ready to see some zoning um, text changes proposed from staff. Um, I won't prescribe to you kind of what heights and building coverages need to be, but in general, I think of T-zones as kind of the Goldilocks, right? So something that is more than single family homes and something that's less than what we allow in the special exception. So uh, I just pulled up what allowed is R1A and R1B and that's a maximum height of 35 feet. And so obviously 40 feet feels like it's not enough. Um, obviously we're not gonna go to 85 feet like we have in our commercial corridors. I'd be comfortable with something in between. Likewise, similarly on building coverage. If single family homes can have 25% building coverage and 35% impervious, um, clearly, we can have you know more than that, probably not as dense as what we might see um, on the commercial streets. So I'll look to staff to figure out what makes sense. Um, I do think, to Caroline's point, the stepping back and the setbacks is really important to be um, mindful of kind of neighborhood transitions. And so um, I think lots of people uh, pointed out the, the two examples in Alexandria where it really resonated. So um, the one that showed you know nice, gentle uh, stepbacks and setbacks are important. Um, two other points. Um, for me, I do not think ground floor commercial is important. In the past, we've talked plenty in EDC about not wanting to force commercial where it's not needed. Um, so that would not be a requirement for me. Um, I also echo Caroline's point around not um, having very stringent parking, especially in places where we might have plentiful um, street parking. I'm certainly open to that, especially if that means that we can get concessions in there like affordable housing. Um, as we talk about residential housing, I think getting affordable concessions here is really important. Um, to Mr. Snyder's point around stormwater and tree canopy, um, I would love for those to be addressed. So if we're going to allow uh, more impervious coverage, maybe they actually have to have more retention. Um, I think in the past, I've already talked about how Arlington for residential redevelopment is requiring that the first three inches of water be retained. This is a great place for us to push that here. It should be happening anywhere where we have residential redevelopment, but certainly in T-zones, um, I'd like to see something like that. And then tree canopy. I think one thing that we all really pride ourselves in is that the neighborhoods are tree-lined. And so where we can think about front yard setbacks and having trees in the front, that matters a lot to kind of create that continuity in the neighborhood. So I'd like to see that. Um, and then I think a final request is besides obviously the Goldilocks stuff and figuring out the guidance there, um, is if staff could just really market test this. Um, I think pulling up examples of what uh, has been done recently in the region is great. But once we have, you know, if we do have proposed kind of parameters on what would fit in a T-zone, I'd love to send it out and see, you know, maybe three to five developers and see whether this is something that they can work with. Um, do the economics work? Is it feasible? Um, so that we can get some realistic feedback based on the real T zones that we have, the size of the lots, and then what we're proposing as the parameters before kind of we uh, talk next steps. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Connolly. Thank you. In the interest of time, I will say I 100% agree with Ms. Hardy. I will associate myself with everything she said. So, Mr. Stoddard, there's two people in that going in that direction. <laughs> That's All easy right. for me to take notes on. <laughs> so, I have a few comments, and I'll be brief as well since the hour is getting late and we have a whole lot still to do. One, I think you need to leave in a single family buy right option. I mean, if there's no buy right option, then I think you've got an issue with just the legality of the zoning. Um, but, uh, Carol, if she's on the phone, maybe that's something you can just think about at another date. But I do think keeping a single family option is appropriate. And I think there are places where it really is kind of the best thing to do as a transition. Um, I think what we've got here as well is sort of different situations. And I think each of us in our own minds are focusing on the one that we're most familiar with or we think is the big biggest problem. So for example, like Park Avenue, things have rolled through on Park Avenue or thereabouts where in our mind, we're trying to address that situation while we're talking about. And yet you talk on North Washington, and to me, that's sort of a different situation. And so I think we do need to be mindful that this may need to have different parameters on different locations, and maybe there are more than one sort of subset to this. But I'm not sure what works on North Washington, even though we think those uses will be here forever, they, they very well may not be including churches. Certainly in Arlington, there are plenty of churches 
that have turned into other things. And so I think we need to be mindful, not only what's there now, but you know, the future is a long time ahead of us. So I would suggest to staff to keep in mind that these, some of these different circumstances, the very small sites that um, are on streets like Park Avenue and the like may have uh, different rules or subset of rules or recommendations or guidance than something, for example, on like North Washington. Um, I would also just say that to me, the, the purpose of this district is quote a transition. And so I think we need to keep that in mind. There's been conversations about tapers and the like, and I think that's really important here because you do have established single family neighborhoods. And I think we should be mindful of that and mindful of what's on either side of these developments. And so the notion of a true transition and a taper, I think is important. Um, I would also echo comments about un unintended consequences. Um, as someone who does uh, some of this work elsewhere, I would say developers will try to go to the kind of lowest hanging fruit. And so for example, if they can develop a project through a T district that doesn't have as many requirements as our typical special exception plan, they're going to do that. So in particular, North Washington projects, they may, uh, if there's an option to do T or even rezone to a T district, they may seek that because, you know, there's not an expectation of school capital contributions. There's not an expectation of other things that we do in these more major projects. So to my mind, in some ways, these things may slice and dice either by location slash and or size of the project. So to me, a four acre project has different requirements and expectations than a half acre site does. And so I guess to staff, I would just say to my mind, there ought to be the flexibility for us on council to approve these projects and not just sort of have across the board, uh, you know, guidelines for every, every project because they're so unique. So I think size is an important consideration as well on a, on a four acre site or, you know, if some of these are that big, I don't know the maximum size. Uh, I would have an expectation that a lot of the requirements for a typical site plan or sp not site plan, a special exception would follow to these kind of projects as well, regardless of the fact that they are happen to be in a T zone. So anyway, I think there's been a lot of good conversation today. I think in general, people are supportive of trying to make better use of these properties. Uh, the devil's in the details. And so, I, you know, staff, Paul, Jim, uh, you got some work ahead of you, but we look forward to hearing your ideas to how to, you know, craft this as finely as possible to address the concerns that have been raised, but not open it up so wide that we, we end up with unintended consequences. So unless has, anyone else has anything on this matter, maybe we'll leave you with that direction and move on to our West Falls Church project or the West Falls project. Thank you. Why Are you up on this or who's doing the staff report on the uh, West Falls? So uh, Carol McCoskery and I both can handle this. I'll just summarize it very briefly. What's before council is a request to authorize the city manager to execute a third amendment to the West Falls Comprehensive Agreement. And there's uh, uh, basically three components to it. One is a request for an additional three months extension to the outside closing date for the senior component for the West Falls project. And I'll, I'll just note for the council that the outside closing date for the, uh, for the uh, ground lease for all the components except the senior component and the phase two components, the outside closing date is April 30th of this year. Um, and uh, by all indications, we're going to hit that deadline. The senior component was originally granted in amendment number two, an additional nine months after that uh, outside closing date. And so the request is to add three months to that to give um, essentially 12 months extension for the senior component. Um, then there are two other components to it, um, adding um, pre-approved senior housing operator uh, would be named in the agreement. We're doing our due diligence on that uh, request uh, right now, and I, and I think we're in, in pretty good shape on that. And, um, and the last thing is uh, naming the guarantor for the construction. And just a, a note on that, for all of the elements of the ground lease, the city has obtained, uh, you know, will obtain prior to closing 
um, the financing will be in place. And with that financing are the guarantee, the completion guarantees for all the elements. And, um, you know, from the city's perspective, we wanted to know before we close on our land um, that what is being proposed is actually going to be built. And so that's the important element uh, that we want to apply to the senior housing component as well. So that's a summary. I'm sure I've missed a uh, couple of things as well. So let me turn it over to Carol uh, for uh, anything additional that she would want to note. I would also just note that the developer is on the call and uh, Robin Betterell representing Falls Church Gateway Partners is available to answer any questions as well. So I'll just add, um, you know, one thing that's important is that this these changes would not change any of the payments. Um, the payments are made with regard to the overall closing for phase one. So they don't affect that in any way. There's some other very minor provisions in here, one of which would um, eliminate all of the um, language about the 7030 issue because that has been resolved with the title company um, after the city's agreement with uh, Fairfax County. And then we've asked that they agree to um, cooperate with um, the project to the north. Um, so we've we've added that language. This agreement is still very much in discussions and some of the provisions that were mentioned tonight are not in the draft that you have because we haven't gotten, um, we're not, haven't gotten agreement to the concept that the language will be. But um, really, I think the primary thing that this amendment will do is extend the time for the senior living um, closing on that property. And that's because those parties changed over time. And um, so the developer has needed to get their new person involved and up to speed and they need a little more time. So that's All right. what I have. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, developer, you have anything to add? All right, I'm gonna take that as a no. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get off mute. No. All right. Questions, comments from council? All right. Ms. Hardy? Just a quick one. Um, so obviously the construction of the senior building would be pushed out too, so it would deliver a year later after all the other components. Is that correct? And so was, I think that was a head nod, Robin. Um, yeah. So I, Correct. So Correct. multifamily, condo, office, hotel, all the ground floor retail, everything else still is on track to deliver at the same time. Yes. And then the senior tower would deliver roughly 12 months later, um, possibly longer. As I understand, there's some licensing um, things, steps that they have to get through that sort of would extend the actual opening. So I guess that's separate of the construction, but um, the retail could probably... Is that where the civic space at? Is I lost track on where it is. I, okay. No, it's in the condo building on Block C. Okay. So what's on the ground floor of the senior one that would be impacted as well? Um, the ground floor retail essentially. So about right now, I think it's eighty five hundred square feet of ground floor retail planned for that building. Okay. That's it. Thank you. All right. What's your um, current plan for a groundbreaking? Um, we're targeting April 1st right now, or whatever the, you know, proximate weekday is to that. Okay. And completion, approximately? Um, it's a little bit staggered, but call it roughly Labor Day 2024. Okay. All right. Other questions or comments from anyone at Council? Our, all right. That was pretty, uh, pretty quick. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, is there anything else you need from us on this, Wyatt? Uh, no, thank you, Mayor. Um, the request is that uh, to schedule this for council consideration at your regular meeting a week from now. So uh, uh, we will work to, to finish up the technical elements to this. And um, our anticipation is that we will 
uh, be successful in that. And um, and so the request is to have this on the agenda for next week. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's keep on moving. I don't know who's handling the rules of procedure. Is that Celeste or is that, uh, who's doing that, Wyatt? So um, we just wanted to have a touching base with the city council as the council's aware they were adopted um, la uh, at your organizational meeting. And maybe the point of tonight's discussion is just to ask if there is a desire to work over these a bit. And if so, maybe we could um, do so at another meeting. But I uh, just wanted to gauge whether there was any interest on that so we could be responsive to any council requests on that. All right, Mr. Duncan. Uh, is this, I just want to ask one question about our order of March during, you know, a normal meeting. Is, is, is this the time to ask that question? Sure. Uh, I just wondered, uh, we hear from the public at the beginning of the meeting, towards the beginning of the meeting, we hear from the public and then we have a little section of, you know, requests from council and then we have the manager's report. And a lot of times the reality of it is, is that the manager and his report answers questions that are posed to him before he gives his report. And so I'm just wondering if it would be more economically useful of time to let the public have their say and then hear a report from the city manager. And then if there's anything he didn't cover, then we could ask our questions and concerns. I don't know. It's just occurred to me many I times that we should at least try that once or twice and see how it feels. I don't know what others. I haven't talked to anybody else about this. I agree with that since I'm the one who's asked a couple of things and then it's, well, we'll get to that in the manager's report. So I, I think that makes sense to me, Phil. Other comments on that? Thoughts? You want to try it, uh, Ms. Connolly? I have another item that I'd like to discuss. Okay. Well, why don't we just try that a week or two and see how it works? One. Why one thing, um, excuse me, Council, but the only thing that I would note is that the items have, it's all receipt of public comments and, and Council requests are included in that. And then the report of the City Manager to Council. I think trying it might be a good idea, but it would mean that the public comment and all would be delayed until after the city manager. So all public comments would be delayed until after the city manager's report, which sometimes is longer. So what, I, th what? I think it's worth trying and then you'll have to see. How okay, well, I vote, I vote to try it. I'm not sure why, I mean, you know, all animals are equal here, but I'm not sure why the public comments and the council requests are seen as the same thing because they're kind of fundamentally different. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to at least give it a try, as long as it's legal to do. Yeah, I mean, we could yeah. do the public comment, or at least it seems to me we could do the public comment, city manager's report, and then council request afterwards. That's what yeah. I'd suggest. That was okay. the All right, why don't we try that, Ms. Connolly? I, I just have a timing question, which I think I brought up last week, but and I've talked to a few people about this. We start our meetings at 7.30, which sometimes seems late. I'm just wondering if there's any interest in starting at seven o'clock. Uh, and then as far as timekeeping goes on that, and I know different people have different situations with their families and in, or work, and it may be hard to get there by seven o'clock, but I think that might be a topic worth considering. Uh, and especially for a city staff who may, that may be helpful to them that they could wouldn't have to, you know, work so start work so late the second time, uh, and then, but that would be a conversation, and we'd really all have to come to consensus on that. And then the other one is just the, the timing. As I read through this, there was all this conversation about timing and how long people can talk and how things are timed. And I think we, it, it just seems like we have we, well, it's ten forty three, and we're on this item that we go on and on and on, and there's so many important things to talk about. And I just wonder if there's a way to look at some of that timing as a group and see if we can come up with any tweaks to that timing as mr duncan just mentioned that might shorten our meetings a bit make them more accessible to the public and us all right some good points i i certainly agree 
with those. First off, we'll just go to the first one. How about um, seven o'clock start time? Thoughts? Hmm. <laughs> kind of tough for me, but I, you know, I, I don't know how being 15 minutes late once a month is a, uh, how, how, uh, how we deal with that. I guess I might be the only one to figure it out. I, I certainly want to address staff needs. Mr. Snyder, you've got your hand up. Is it response to that question or something else? Yeah. Um, if we ever get back to more pre-pandemic where people are working downtown, it's really hard to get here by 7. Um, frankly, sometimes by 7.30, but 7 is very difficult. Like right now, maybe less so, um, but just, just a, a concern. So why don't we do this? Why don't uh, Wyatt, Celeste, some staff give some thought to us, maybe give us some feedback, you know, either tomorrow morning or, or next week and just mull this over. I think revisiting how we do business, how we can do it better is a very useful exercise. I understand what you've just said, um, Dave, but let's why don't we hear from staff? I don't know if you have any, any immediate thoughts or you guys just want to talk it over, think it over um, and then give us some feedback on that. And then as to your second point, Mary Beth, this notion of like, you know, how long we talk, and I think that's well taken. And um, I, I do think we need to try to tighten up our meetings, whether that's less on the agenda um, and just a more narrow focus, or whether it's we just talk less, you know, <laughs> I think it sort of comes down to those two things. And I don't know whether we want to either self-regulate ourselves more you know, regulate ourselves with the explicit things that we uh, times we're going to keep to or that I be more aggressive in terms of like cutting people off, um, either in terms of the amount of time or amount of questions. I'd certainly be interested in feedback or thoughts from everyone on, on how to make our meetings run better. And I think you've raised some some excellent points. Does anybody have thoughts on that second issue Mary Beth raised? <laughs> Okay. I think both need to happen in order to have okay. shorter. I, I I enjoy hearing all of you talk. So you know, <laughs> I I've been hesitant to kind of you know cut people off because a lot of good conversation that goes on. But these meetings are going on for a pretty lo good long time. Is there an appetite to do that to be kind of stricter about how long people talk or how many questions they ask? All right, I'm going to take that as a maybe, and so uh, please don't take offense if I, um, you know, try to cut people off, uh, or I maybe. Cut, people, cut people off a little bit more, um, or try to limit the questions. So I'm going to be a little more aggressive than maybe I have been, and let's see how that goes. But please don't take offense uh, if I do that to you, um, Letty. Yeah, I was going to say, as one of the offenders of asking lots of questions, I also think the public certainly expects to have really robust discussion. Um, and so that's something to, to consider as well. All right. Well, it's a, it's a fine line, right? You know, between too much, too little, and, you know, getting through the issues and getting through the night. Um, Debbie, did you have an additional comment? I was just going to say, I, I think it's also part of the culture to the robust experience. Like, I liked um, tonight, Mary Beth's like, yeah, yes, I agree. Uh, I feel like we all feel like we all need to comment on every topic that comes up, even if we're saying comparable things. And that's just kind of become the culture uh, and the nature of trying to be, you know, be on the record or or whatever. Um, I think that's difficult when you have seven people who all um, comment on everything and we have so many things on the agenda. So I think it's multi-pronged, like trying to sh slightly shift the, you know, the culture of always having to comment on everything and then also just tighten your agenda. But I mean, we've had so many meaty things to be talking about. It's hard to think about what we would be cutting. So it's a, it's a difficult situation. All right, well, I'm gonna, I am personally gonna try to uh, be a little more assertive um, in cutting a back conversation when it ends up uh, lingering too long. And I think too, in terms of just the ambition of our agendas at times, maybe uh, just the, you know, our, our reach is uh, uh, beyond our, whatever that phrase is, that we're just trying a little bit too hard. 
So I'm, I'm going to work on that a little bit myself. But again, don't, don't take offense at that. Um, why don't we move on to the next part, which is our council appointments and the like. And I think mostly there's not a lot of conflict. There may be a few places. Celeste, are you on the line? I think she's the keeper yes. of the keeper of the uh, you know the the organizational document. Um, do you want to go through some of the issues or areas where there's conflict or where there's nobody at? We'll see if we can fill those spots and make yeah, some progress. I don't think maybe we had a lot of conflict. Um, there are a few places where we might need some coverage. Sorry, my, Plus, my I computer know, fell asleep. <laughs> It, there we go. You fell um, asleep. Also, didn't so, I have to admit I thought you put your name in for those that you'd be willing, not necessarily taking everything that you put your name next to. <laughs> Truth sorry. <play. laughs> um, you definitely. Having not gone through this process before, I'm not. Yeah, and and that's why we do it at work session too, so you can kind of um, talk. I maybe talk about you know, how you want to spend your time and, and see what others have asked for. I'm trying to see if I can share this document. And it may be that some of this is better done at our meeting tomorrow morning and another uh, eight hours or nine hours or whatever it is. So um, I, I don't think we ought to get into total minutia. If there's any big things like, yeah. hey, does anybody want to do this? You maybe can I would like, out. Um, so there's a food and agriculture Agriculture Regional Policy Committee, Regional Member Policy Committee, um, and that's new for COG, I believe. We haven't had that before, and so if somebody is particularly interested or would like, they they would like like to have at least one member on that. So I don't know if anybody has that interest. It's looking more about um, food um, safe safety supply food supply i think a lot of that but i think some of um the urban agriculture stuff could go into that as well can we appoint ross lickenhouse to do that yeah, yeah he could be honorary member <laughs> <Dan Cog. laughs> does anyone else have an interest I, i'm not raising my hand for that one but celeste while you're pulling up the document i looked at Lena what set her hand up so make note, the record reflect uh, <laughs> sorry raise her hand uh, for um, agriculture. Uh, We're going to discuss it more tomorrow. The places where I think we have blanks is the AAB Architectural Advisory Board and then the Retirement Board. And Debbie, I did note that you had signed up for a whole lot. And so if there's like, things that you want to give up, maybe come prepared tomorrow to say which ones you'd rank higher maybe, and then we can work it out. But those were the two that actually needed coverage. And then I didn't see a whole bunch of conflict otherwise. And I think Mayor Tarter usually is the liaison to the Retirement Board. Um, okay, well, that's fine. Put me on there. Okay. Who ended up with public utilities? Um, I have Miss Shans Hiscott signed up, and she was the only one who asked for it. Okay. And who ended up uh, with GovOps? I thought I saw one document where I was the only name, and I. I uh, let's you. see. I only have. Uh, I only have you on GovOps, but Miss Conley said. I believe she said, no, she, you, you wanted to get off. That's correct. Ms. Celeste, Conley. you didn't put mine in yet, but I had off the email I sent and you had mine in there. Is this Letty? I'm sorry. I can't see. When yes. I'm yeah, the that's Letty. Oh, I didn't receive yours. So that's why you're not in there. <laughs> yeah. The email I sent today. Okay. So I'd fill in last where people had holes. So. I wondered about that too. So did you add yourself to EDC? I put myself on appointments GovOps, since there was only one person, EDC, if you'll have me, and then various other boards. Okay, good. Okay. And so we have three folks on appointments, unless um, Ms. Conley would also like to, this, you probably need to talk about this, yeah. is interested in the CACT. Um, I offered to, Dave, you have been CACT rep for a long time, so I offered to take that one. I didn't talk about this with you personally, but I will take that one if you would like to relinquish it or if no one else wants it. If I do that, then I can't be on appointments. But it's good to have three people on appointments because then 
you can sort of take turns or if one person can't be there, you can still have the meeting. So I, I, we can talk about that offline, Mr. Snyder, before tomorrow morning and it, however that works. Okay. I agree. It's been great to have three on appointments. So if it's not you, Mary Beth, maybe someone else. Yeah. And then the other one that is the Chamber of Commerce. I had two folks. Of the, yep, and we're two. not direct. Um, they're not one of our boards. So it's more of a community organization, a civic organization. But Mr. Duncan and Ms. Leon. Asked yeah, the hitch there is that Mary Beth goes for her day job. So that makes three of us. So three of us can't be there. We had this with Ross last time, too. Right. And I, guess I have to go so. for my job. And are you discussing city business? Yeah. With them? You are. That's pretty much the point of the point yeah. of us being there. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I you can... all need to think about that. Yeah. And may I ask who um, I can the read. Housing Commission liaison? Is that Ms. Hardy still? Yeah, I'd offer myself in that. Good. I'll read okay. that email. Okay, well, I'll tell you, um, I think we made a little bit of progress. It's 11 o'clock, and we still have a um, the consent items and also a closed session. So why don't we call it an evening? Uh, Jess, did you have a comment? I don't know if that was accidental, yes, but sir, your I'm, hand went I don't know if I missed uh, my opportunity to ask. I, I don't know, if, was it ever talked about? And I'm if I missed the boat, I'm sorry, uh, lowering the speed limit to 20 miles per hour in residential uh, streets. Did we hit on that and I, and I missed it? Was that so a I'm not sure we all? had, I mean, that, that matter's kind of come and gone. Um, if you got a quick comment, we'd, we'd be delighted to hear it. But we've moved on to a couple items past that. Oh, no, um, I know. I know. I've been, I've been holding on. I, okay. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Uh, I just, if it was discussed at all, I know that uh, I had heard the council was interested in it and I just didn't hear what the staff put out about is, are we going to take a look at doing that or not? And Mayor, I could jump in just briefly yeah. if you'd like. Okay. Um, yeah, we did not include it in the presentation largely because we knew Zach was, he's our project manager for that to do the engineering um, uh, context for it. Um, we'll get back with council on a discussion of that. We do have a plan for that, and uh, but we need to get the council, uh, you know, obviously approval of it and an ordinance change. And so those would be the next steps on that. Uh, we'll schedule that for a future work session. All right, Jess, since you've hung on, why don't you give us the short version of your comments on that? Um, well, uh, to be honest, I so I was I had another comment unrelated. I'll I'll, I'll try to keep this short. I mean, I, I'm totally in favor and I'm pretty sure most of my CACT comrades are also in favor of at least a, a pilot program. Um, a lot of us uh, are feel like the you know, just as as a uh, vice mayor Hardy said, a lot of us will put pedestrians and bikes safety ahead of car safety, uh, not only on our major thoroughfares but especially residential streets um, because uh, as I think a lot of you may know, we have a lot of cut through traffic. And that causes a lot of con uh, safety concerns on residential streets, especially for me. I live uh, very near uh, Oak Street Elementary, which is you have to go through residential on every direction that you're coming to Oak Street. You're going driving through a residential area. Um, that school zone is uh, vastly undermarked. There's like literally no street markings telling you you're approaching a zone. There's one school sign. I know more have been ordered. Anyway, uh, that's all I had to say on that. I, I think a lot of us are, are on CACT are interested in seeing that happen. Um, and if I may, the other comment I wanted to make, um, I think everybody on, on this call is in violent agreement that pedestrian safety is a concern for us and for a lot of residents. I heard Vice Mayor uh, Hari say it, Councilman um, Hiscock, Mayor Tarter, I heard all of you comment on 
we we want to see progress and and I understand staff is limited pandemic has made it even more strenuous uh, budget is is also an issue but it's it uh, the appetite for it is aggressive and progress is slow and this isn't a hit on staff but I what I would ask is that we think outside the box and look at possibility of an outside contractor outside project manager to take a look at the city as a whole sidewalk issues uh, pedestrian issues um, and 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 what would it take as I think I think I heard a couple of you ask what would it take to get there uh, to make a big difference so that we can address things that have been issued issues for decades um, so anyway that's my final request thank you for your time thank you for yours and thank you for sticking around um, we look forward to working further with you and the CACT on a lot of these issues. They're, they're of great importance to, to us and the whole city. So thank you very much. Um, Wyatt, we've got these future consent um, items. I'm going to uh, exercise the will of council, which is to go quickly and uh, keep conversation brief. So you're the first uh, test subject on that. So uh, have at it. Um, so the uh, Cindy is going to handle them. Um, Cindy, can you do it super brief? Uh, sir, uh, sir, and Carrie, stop. RSTP is our annual uh, resolution and our application through NVTA. Uh, we put in for a higher amount than we know what will actually work through the process because um, we always want to have more and extra. And this goes into the CIP for pedestrian accessibility and walkability. So it's a very important uh, grant application and the deadline's upon us. So uh, we are requesting council approve it next Monday. And then, um, so that's sort of through NVTA. And the second one is our application to commuter choice through NVTC, and this is using the toll revenues, and this is put forth for bike share. So quick synopsis, but Carrie is also available for any questions. All right, All right any, any questions? questions? Okay, okay that, that sounds, sounds great. great. Um, let's, um, we do have a closed session. I'm gonna add 30 seconds question or comment. Uh, the bike share, it's so important that we get these developers to pay through their projects so we don't have to continue to seek funding and do all these other things that be part of the traffic uh, transportation demand management plan so that it's not a continuing burden on the city but on the developer where I think it belongs in association with new development. So anyway, that's my editorial. It's over. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to say before we go into <laughs> closed session? So we need to take down the cameras or do a little work like that. How long is that going to take, um, Cindy or Celeste? Seconded by council member. Hardy. Yeah. I got Hardy first. Um, and passed by a vote of city council. Council went in a closed session pursuant to Virginia code section 2.2-3711A3 for discussion or consideration of the disposition of publicly held real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body. Property north of high school currently leased to Virginia Tech. Council member Connolly. Yes. Duncan? Yes. Hardy? Yes. Leon? Yes. Iscott? Yes. Snyder? Yeah. Tartar? Yep. All right, so let's take a five minute break. It's 11. Let's go take a break till 11.05, a recess. We'll reconvene at 11.05 in closed session. Thank you.
and hit slash rush mark would would sign um, and then actually.
All right, so what delay are we doing now? A 10 second delay or a 40 second delay or how many seconds are we into now? It's for it to catch up. We're on and live. You're good to go, Mayor, with your motions. Thank you. All right, All right we're coming, coming in at a closed session uh, and we're going to uh, do a motion to come out of closed session upon a motion made by council member Snyder. Seconded by council member. Yes, and passed by a vote of city council. Council reconvened in an open session. Council member Connolly. Right, so yes. Now, Duncan. Seconds. Yes. Hardy. Yes. Leon. Yes. Scott. Yes. Snyder. Yeah. Tartar. Yep. It is 1123. This is a certification upon a motion made by council member. Snyder. Snyder. And seconded by council member. Iscott. Iscott. And passed upon affirmative roll call vote in open session. It was certified that only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed session or meeting by the body. Council Member Connolly? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Hardy? Yes. Leon? Yes. Iscott? Yes. Snyder? Yeah. Tartar? Yep. All right. It's 1124. Is there anything else anybody wants to say? Before we uh, adjourn, we're going to be seeing each other in another nine hours or so. Um, any last words from anyone? How about we're adjourned? Does that work? We're adjourned. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.